So um, it's nice to see you here in Warsaw and um, let me welcome you at the symposium, International Symposium History in uh, the Lvov Warsaw School <coughs> History of uh, the Lvov Warsaw School. It's my great uh, pleasure to uh, welcome you here and also uh, these uh, colleagues who joined us uh, online. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Paweł Łukow, the Dean of Faculty of Philosophy of University of Warsaw, uh, who would say a few words uh, on behalf of organizers. Okay, good morning. It's very nice to be here. Uh, you probably noticed that when you enter this building, there are four columns, the statues there. And that probably shows or is a proof in stone of how important uh, the Lvov Warsaw School is to the university, not just to the faculty of philosophy. Um, another thing which I would like to start with to stress the importance of the school. Last Monday, I was in the Jagiellonian University where Professor Jan Wolenski was awarded honorary professorship of the university. And it was my greatest pleasure uh, to know, as we all know, that one of his greatest achievements is, are his publications on the Lvov Warsaw School, which gave me a very special kind of satisfaction to be there and to see that such a great philosopher and logician and lawyer of the official of law is being awarded this, this, this honor. Many people think that philosophy is about being unclear, uh, think label <coughs> mostly, that doing philosophy is about being cryptic and saying things which can reach only those who are versed in a very special kind of literature. And uh, I think that the Lvov Warsaw School is probably the clear proof that it's not necessarily the case. I would say it's not the case, but that's my opinion. Uh, as we all know, the members of the school program, although it hasn't been so explicitly uh, as a whole written down, I guess we all can, we all remember that part of their program was in particular to have an anti-irrationalist attitude, to speak clearly, to define concepts, to analyze thoroughly the problems that they were confronted with. And in this way, I guess they uh, they set a standard that for us today is a kind of orientation point in philosophy, at least to many of us. One of the things that, among other analytic traditions, that was special about the Lvov Warsaw School was its historical awareness, I would say. I think oftentimes we hear complain that much of the analytic philosophy is not very much sort of sensitive to the historical uh, heritage of modern, modern philosophy. And when it comes to Lvov Warsaw School, this was not the case, quite the reverse. Being in touch with history uh, was part of their strivings for clear presentation for clarity of thought. Uh, and as we all know, the founder person was Kazimierz Tarowski, who set up the, also among other things, the Polish Philosophical Society, which I have the <coughs> honor to be the president currently of, which is another uh, splendor for me. Let me, so I think that here we are in a very special company of people who want to do thorough philosophy, philosophy that aims at maximum possible clarity. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to have you here, and I would like to thank Professor Brozek for being the spiritus moments of this event and many similar events in the past and I'm sure in the future. Uh, I would to 
extending my congratulations and extending my uh, wishes to you for very fruitful uh, uh, discussions and, and presentations. Let me end with a quote from Arnowski about the university as such, because I think today in these times we can appreciate the importance of the academia in general, despite all kinds of doubts, complaints, and difficulties we encounter when it comes to the organizational and institutional part of the academia. On the other hand, I feel that we have to be aware of the fact that philosophy needs a hospitable institutional environment in particular. So let me quote from Sadowski, which I think will be the best way to end. The university, having the full right to insight, to insist that its spiritual independence is not violated by anyone, has the full right to defend itself against any explicit or insidious attempt to subject its scientific work to anyone's control or comment. The university teacher is first and foremost a servant of the objective truth, its representative and herald among young people and society. This service is noble and extremely honorable, but at the same time, it requires not only appropriate intellectual qualifications and appropriate professional knowledge, but also great fortitude and strong character. Being an ethicist, I would like to stress the ending sentence. So I would like to wish you all fortitude and strong character in your investigations of truth and clarity and philosophy as such. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I would like to stress that our symposium uh, has um, several um, organizers. Uh, the first one is, of course, Faculty of Philosophy, uh, University of Warsaw, and in particular, the uh, Lwopolsu School Research Center, which was founded two years ago at our faculty. Uh, but among organizers, there are also an, uh, other institutions, such as uh, Cardinal Stefan Wyszyński uh, University, uh, Kazimierz Twardowski uh, Philosophical Society of Lviv, and the uh, Committee for Philosophical Disciplines Polish Academy of Science, uh, and Kazimierz Wielki University in Bydgoszcz. And uh, I got, uh, because not everybody, not all representatives of these institutions could join us today in person, uh, but I got some letters from them and one film from them, and I would like to share this uh, with you. The first one is um, the letter from Joanna Odrowosz-Sypniewska, uh, who is um, the head of uh, Committee for Philosophical Disciplines. Joanna wrote, Dear participants, I am pleased to extend my greetings and warm welcome to all participants of the conference history in of the Lwowosu School. Committee for Philosophical Sciences of uh, the Polish Academy of uh, Sciences is pleased to participate in the organization of this conference, which gathers philosophers who appreciate the developed ideas of the Warsaw School. This is another of international conferences organized by this project and her colleagues supported by the Committee of Philosophical Sciences. The previous ones include the legacy of Kazimierz Twardowski, Roman in Garden and the Warsaw School, the world of values from the point of view of the Warsaw School, which have all been very successful. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to use this opportunity to express my gratitude to the project, uh, efforts to propagate and develop the achievements of the philosophers from the Warsaw School. Please accept my best wishes and uh, for a successful and enjoyable conference. And another letter uh, from, uh, from our colleague uh, from Bydgoszcz, who, namely uh, Dariusz Łukasiewicz. Uh, Dariusz Łukasiewicz uh, is not a relative of uh, Jan Łukasiewicz, <laughs> but in a very uh, nice way, uh, he uh, uh, wrote about uh, Jan Łukasiewicz in his letter. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, 
And when a year ago, Anna and I, so me and, and Dariusz, decided to organize a conference on the history of philosophy at the Lwowosu School, we naturally did not know that the history would come full circle. The Lwowosu School uh, was also formed during the World War I, the revolution in Russia and Polish Bolshevik War. The latter ended with a victory. And now it's war again. Our Ukrainian friends were and still are attacked by the totalitarian Russian Empire. Innocent people are killed, tortured, or live in constant danger. All this is happening now, a few hundred kilometers from Warsaw. What shall we say? Among the members of the Lwowosu School were Poles, Jews, Ukrainians. And here and now we stand together, again, in the face of blind irrationalism and barbarian power. What conclusions can be drawn from the history of the Lwowosu School today? I think that we have to fight against the cruel evil together to the final victory. But our great predecessors, who were great scholars, were able, even in the most difficult times, to make science at the highest world level. In 1918, Jan Lukasiewicz, as the rector of the University of Warsaw, gave a lecture entitled On the Spiritual Fight. In this lecture, he presented the results of his research on determinism and human freedom. He said, deeds of creative individual can be free and change the history of the world. I have no doubt that our conference will be a demonstration of the creative deeds of individuals that will change the future and the future is full of possibilities. Among these possibilities, I see the possibility of victory, of good over evil, truth over lies, rationalism over anti-irrationalism and ultimately life over death. I wish you all to remember this conference as a time of hope, but also time of scientific creative discussions and excellent presentations. I express my admiration and gratitude for the tremendous work of and the project uh, has done to organize this conference. I regret that I'm unable to attend this great event, but I hope to meet you all in the in 2024. Enjoy your conference, Dariusz Lukasiewicz. And um, our last um, uh, greetings uh, is greeting from uh, from Lvov, uh, from Ukrainian city. In fact, uh, it's uh, from Ola Ponchorenko, the president of Kazimierz Twardowski uh, Philosophical Society of Lviv, and this it's a, in the form of a film. I'm not sure whether our participants online will see this film, but you may just go to our website. Uh, I, I think I sent the, the, the this website address to all participants and the, the film uh, may be just uh, uh, it's located there and you, you might watch it in, uh, online. And I will just present this short film uh, here to traditional participants in our library. Hello, dear friends. The Lviv Warsaw School belongs to history. Researches of the history of philosophy have properly assessed Kazimierz Twardowski's role in the development of Western Dance philosophical tradition. It is well known that in the history of philosophy, how the method of philosophizing and scientific language uh, were present in the Lviv Warsaw School. Such representatives of the divorce of school as Kazimierz Rybkiewicz, Tadeusz Rybkiewicz, Stanislaw Wisniewski, Jan Kukaszkiewicz, and Alfred Tarski are widely recognized in this award. The contribution of the divorce of school to the development of logic is undeniable. At the same time, it is generally believed that the uh, divorce of school is not a family as it deserves to be. The scientific activity of Kazimierz Twardowski is not properly evaluated from the perspective of the development of the Islamic philosophical tradition. The attitude of the viewers of school toward philosophy and its role in human life and society is put known in the history of philosophy. Such a prominent representative as Stepan Valai, Stepan Alexei, Behem Yorama, Gabriel Kostanik, Alexander Kulchevsky are hardly known to the world public. 
Therefore, it is serious, important, difficult, history in and all the every universe of school, which aims to contribute to the universe of school becoming more popular. I believe this would help the world to resist the internationalism which is trying to dominate today, provoking people to do insane things. After all, philosophy for the universe of school was not only the queen of science, but also the point in human life. Dear friends, I wish you to have an interesting discussion and keep pleasure from the meeting. Uh, unfortunately, um, the war is happening all the time, uh, just a few hundred kilometers uh, from Warsaw, like uh, Darius wrote in uh, his letter. Unfortunately, it forced us to some changes in our program because I, uh, yesterday I got a dramatic letter uh, from our colleague uh, from Kyiv, uh, Professor Irina Komenko. Uh, because of constant bombing in, in Kyiv, she is unable to connect with us. Uh, she is very sorry, but uh, Probably the city will be cut off uh, electricity soon, and uh, she's really unable uh, to, pre to, pre to prepare anything and present with us. That's, that's why tomorrow we will start um, at 10.30 uh, from the uh, lecture of Professor uh, Roman Muras. Uh, and today it's my great pleasure to start our first session, which is entitled Logic and History One, because we've got three sessions in logic. Uh, Good, because Warsaw is the capital of logic. <laughs> um, uh, and our first speaker uh, in our first session is uh, Professor uh, Martin Tkaczek uh, from uh, Dublin. And the title of his lecture is History and Logic um, in the History of Logic. Hello, may I thank Professor Nabrożek and all the organizers for including my talk. Everyone knows that you have to include logic itself to work successfully in the field of the history of logic. Everyone knows it. However, it is far from clear what it means to include logic in the history of logic. Everyone knows it since the founders of the contemporary history of logic from the Lvov Warsaw School, and particularly from the Warsaw Division of the school, from the capital of logic, as Professor Brodek mentioned, they insisted that it is vital to understand the sources in the history of logic, to understand logic itself. And they even emphasized and Jan Łukasiewicz emphasized, Józef Maria Bocheński even ridiculed those historians of logic who failed to understand logic itself. So 
it, it, it is the entire 20th century history of logic. It is clear for everyone that you need to understand, you need to evolve logic itself to work successfully in the field of the history of logic. In the 20th century, it was clear, at least, what logic means in the phrase, in the expression to involve logic. It was the mathematical logic, particularly the logic created and originated by Gottlob Frege and Charles Sanders Peirce. Classical logical calculus, not necessarily of the first order, something like that. At the end, of the 20th century, in logic, the pendulum moved towards non-classical logics and towards what we call logical pluralism. And in the 21st century of logic, even the word logic within the history of logic is not perfectly clear anymore. Logicians working in the field of different non-classical logics tend to search for origins and foundations for their uh, logical ideas in the sources. And the word to include, particularly, was never perfectly clear. It is, it is beyond the dispute that, as I have already mentioned, according to the creators, to the founders of the history of logic, you need to understand, to be skilled in logic, to understand and to value the sources. But in practice, they often do much more, more or less consciously. And today I'll try to address this question, what it means to include or involve logic itself in the field of the history of logic, when doing history of logic. I'll begin with two examples of problems, of historical problems. Example one is extremely simple, even funnier. It's a toy example. It is aimed to awaken some of our intuitions. And then example two comes to shake those intuitions. So let us look at the example one. I can't do it. I can't move the slide. Okay. Okay. I hope you can see the first slide. So it, it is the funny example, the toy example, but, but do, not, do not underestimate it. Imagine you are a historian of logic, you are about to make a historical statement, and you have three sources. History is a science of sources. Logic is a science of reasoning. History is a science of sources. So you you are three historical sources to deal with. Freges, Grundgesetze der Arithmetik, Volume 1, released in 1893. And in the source, Frege claims the theory, the axiomatic theory presented in the book. The theory I present is consistent. Then the famous letter from Russell comes and claiming that Frege's theory is not consistent. And a year later, Frege admits in Grundgesetze Volume 2, volume two that he was mistaken and the theory he presented previously is actually not consistent. So we have three sources as a discussion. And now the question, is Frege's theory, Grundgesetze theory, consistent? This is a, quest, a historical question. And I take it for granted that everyone answers no. The theory Frege presented in Grundgesetze is not consistent. 
I think everyone who delivers lectures in theory or better lectures in logic had to answer the question many times and it was usually the negative answer. But now imagine the last source does not exist. Either Frege never admitted Russell was right, or he did admit it, but the source got lost. What would be the answer then? Is Frege theory consistent? Or even imagine even that the two sources does not actually exist at your time. So all you have at your hands is the first source. Frege's Grundgesetze volume, volume 1, claiming the theory is consistent. What would be your answer then, as a historian? Is Frege's theory consistent or not? Is Frege's theory consistent or not? So this is the toy example. Now let us move to example 2. Example 2 is a true problem, a real problem, dealing with, being dealt with, in the contemporary history of logic. Was or is the ancient logic explosive? So does, does it contain the rule of explosion? That's Scottish rule, in other words. Are Aristotle's and the Stoics particularly logic explosive? And the history of logic, the 21st century history of logic, answers no, neither Aristotle's nor the Stoics logic is explosive. And the list of sources for the claim may be extended. It is a received wisdom in companions and textbooks. I listed only sources which deliver some substantiation for, for the claim. So the general attitude, the general thesis in the 21st century of logic, the 21st century history of logic, is the ancient logic, either from Aristotle or from the Stoics, is not explosive. The principle of explosion was invented in the middle century, in the, in the, in the Middle Ages, we don't actually know in the, the century, but in the Middle Ages definitely. And the ancient logic is was not explosive. It was Depending on the source, some of them say the, the ancient logic was part consistent, other the ancient logic was relevant, other use different, even different words. But the thesis eventually at the end is that no ancient logic was explosive. And what is the substantiation? What is the justification of the thesis. It is a historical one. They base the thesis on the sources. For Aristotle, it is the famous quote at the beginning of prior analytics. Aristotle's definition of syllogism, or maybe I should say one of his definitions of syllogism. Aristotle says, that syllogism is a discourse in which certain things being stated, something other than what is stated follows of necessity from their being so, and adds, it follows, what follows, it follows because of them, meaning because of the premises, because of the things being stated. And they say, if you compare it with the principle of explosion, you see that it is possible to substitute in the, in the principle of explosion, the effect that you achieve a consequence, an example of consequence, in which the conclusion is equal to a premise, which is rejected by Aristotle. And since an, an example, an instance of the principle, has been rejected the entire principle, has been rejected by Aristotle. And analogically with the Stoics, there is only single mention um, in Sextus Empiricus, outlines of theonism, 
the Stoics do not accept syllogisms with superfluous, superfluous premises. And analogically, if you compare it with the principle of explosion, uh, the, the second premise might be considered superfluous, although, by the way, it is not that obvious, but generally those making history of logic at this point agree that this, this instance, the instance I presented, the instance of the principle of explosion, is contradicted by Sextus's mention. So this is, in short, the answer the contemporary history of logic gives to the question, is the ancient logic explosive, but consistent, relevant, or right? However, when you read other sources, other sources, you can observe that the Stoics, the logicians of the Stoic school, they openly endorse the following assumptions. The rule of the uniform substitution, the Boolean connectives of negation and conjunction, they argue unendlessly about other connectives, particularly disjunction and the conditional implication, but with respect to the connective of negation and conjunction, they always universally obey the Boolean, full-blooded classical propositional calculus way of the school connectives. And then they accept openly some derivation rules. The first one is obviously the rule of double negation. It is attested multiply in the sources, and famously, very famously, they, they accept the rule of principle called conjunctive syllogism. If it is not the case that phi and c and phi, it follows that not c. It is axiom three of the Stoics syllogistic. A very famous one of, of the so-called modi, Stoics modi, with nodus ponens being the most famous one. So they famously accept the principle, and eventually they do less famously, but uh, there are sources found to the effect that they accept universally the rule of cut as well. So if phi can be deduced from the set phi, and C can be deduced from a set C together with the sentence phi, then C can be deduced from the sets phi and C combined. So those are not conjectures. Those are claims stated openly and clearly in the source, in the extant sources. We know the Stoics universally, when doing logic, they do accept those principles. And the point is, those principles are sufficient to deduce the rule of explosion. And may I mention that there are other ways to, to infer the rule of explosion within the Stoic logic. There are simpler proofs than the one I'm going to present. The one I'm presenting is my personal favorite. So this a proof, a proof of the principle of explosion using exclusively, exclusively ex assumptions openly endorsed by the Stoic logicians. So we begin with a version of the principle of contradiction, of non-contradiction, based on the Boolean understanding of the connectives of negation and conjunction the rule of double negation, and then you substitute in the conjunctive syllogism twice. You may observe, comparing line three and four of the proof, that the objective is to have 
sentence phi and sentence not phi left in the antecedent of the theorem. And then you simply apply the rule of cut to achieve the principle of explosion. So it is a proof. There are more proofs. Excuse me. There are more proofs based on uh, Stoic's written claims, extant written claims, allowing to deduce the principle of explosion. This is one of them. So now let us come back to the question. Is the Stoic logic, is the Stoic logic explosive? As I have said, as I have mentioned, the contemporary history of logic practically unanimously, if you consider me as a history of logic, it is not perfect. But practically unanimously, the, the contemporary history of logic answers no. So come back to the toy example for a moment, to the Russell, Russell's paradox, paradox example. What the contemporary history of logic does in this very point is answer based on the open claims of the sources exclusively without deducing any, anything from the sources unless a theorem unless a theorem has been deduced by the stoics and there are extant sources concerning proofs of stoic syllogism but unless a proof and a theorem is contained in a source it is not considered existing in the logic by the contemporary history. So they, they behave in a way which make you answer the Frege, Frege's theory is consistent based on Frege's claim in volume one of Grundgesetze, at least, at least in, in the possible world in which Russell's letters, uh, volume two, Bundgesetze, volume two, and other texts by Zermelo and Cantor cease to exist. So they, they, the history of logic in the 21st century act as if it were ready to answer yes to the question of consistency of Fergus Pierre. So we are at the, in the point, in the point where we consider two different, at the moment, two different labels of using logic within the history of logic. Label one, it is beyond the dispute, as I have said. The, the great philosophers of the world also stood for us. So you need to use logic to understand. You have to be skilled in logic to understand and value the sources. But there is label two. Can you deduce from the sources using logic within the field of the history of logic? But there is more. Another question I want to deal with shortly is can you, can you use induction? Induction in the field of the history of logic. The historians do when they need, they do. And I don't mean the basic induction when, when you work as a historian, simply as a historian dealing with the sources. I mean, can you use induction to hypothesize about assumptions the sources should make, the sources are committed to by their deductive practice? As we know, as we know, until Jan Lukasiewicz. Not all assumptions have been listed in axiomatic systems when, when those systems were originally created. So there are, there are deductive moves, there are steps and proofs which ancient logicians do without describing them. 
can you, are you allowed to read deductively, hypothetic, hypothetically, to read deduction rules, their acceptance or rejection, out of the deductive practice? For instance, imagine the principle of double negation was not listed in the, in the source. It is possible, it is listed in, with respect to the stoic logic. It is listed in two extant sources, Diogenes and Alexander of Aphrodites. So it is possible, it is possible to think that those sources got lost. Can you read out of the Stoics practice that they accepted the rule and claim their logic was, for instance, explosive based on the induction to prove that? If yes, if so, if so, may I, may I tell you that you can conduct the proof of the principle of explosion I presented within the Aristotle's model. The principle of double negation is the only, the only assumption required to finish the proof absent in Aristotle's text. Can you hypothesize that Aristotle would accept the principle? Well, uh, premise one, Although Aristotle, as far as I am aware, never mentions the principle of double negation, he does actually mention and accept the principle of double term negation. Double term negation. X equals minus minus X. He doesn't go so. And together, perhaps together with his account of the contradictory statements, the fear of opposition, of state of categorical statements, perhaps you are allowed to inductively accept Aristotle that the principle of double negation does belong to Aristotle's logic. If you tend to answer no, you should be aware that the contemporary history of logic always and everywhere uses induction in this way, in, in that very fashion. For instance, let us let us remain in the field of the Stoic logic. Graham Priest, who is a strong supporter of the thesis that the ancient logic was paraconsistent, it's not explosive, gives the following argument. What you can see on the slide is an extremely simple, the famous, extremely simple proof of the principle of explosion, the medieval one. Now, the Stoics, premise one, the Stoics were skilled logicians. Premise two, they endorsed line two. All they required to finish this two line, three line, two step, three line proof is the disjunction introduction principle. So, Priest says, it is unbelievable, unbelievable, they didn't notice it. So it is, as they don't deliver the proof of the principle of explosion, you must accept they rejected the disjunction introduction. You must, you must induce, you must hypothesize that they reject, that they positively rejected line one. So the history of logic makes inductions in different directions leading to different answers to questions. And they, not often, they are aware of it. And there, is, there is the final label of involvement of logic. Can you decide which logic to use to deduce conclusions from the sources? If you, if you can correct the sources in one way, for instance, by hypothesizing about them, you could think of correcting the sources in other ways. And 
to honor the Lwów Warsaw School, may I remind you that Jamon Kasiewicz and Józef Maria Bocheński in their seminal works claimed that Aristotle's method of the indirect proof, proof by the reduction to absurd, in syllogistic is invalid. But they do it based, the, the claim is based vitally on the principles of the mathematical logic, 20th century of mathematical logic, absolutely foreign to the past. So they, they use, let us, let us call it uh, object logic, the logic of the source, the logic you can reasonably attribute to the source you deal with, and subject logic, the logic the logician, the historian, believes to be correct. So you have to decide when doing history of logic if you deduce, if you deduce conclusions from the sources, from the assumptions the sources contain, mm -hmm. using the object logic or the subject. Let us try to summarize and slightly generalize our thoughts. As I have said, everyone knows that you have to involve logic itself, the systematic logic, into the history of logic in, uh, in order for the latter to be successful. So it, the sentence, the claim, the principle, Bukasiewicz, Scholz, Bocheński, and other may mean at least four different things, or it may be involved in four different levels, higher and higher. The first, the basic level, is simply the understanding and valuing the sources. As I have said, it is practically beyond dispute after, after historical works of the Warsaw School. But there is, a, there is a question, can you deduce conclusions from the sources? And the answer, the answer today must be we don't know. We don't know. Can you hypothesizing assumptions of the sources? Can you read axioms and primitive rules out of the deductive practice of your sources? And finally, can you use the logic you believe to be correct, even though it's foreign to the source, to deduce those conclusions and to find even sometimes mistakes, errors in your source? To all those questions, except the first one, except the first one, the answer today, I think, is we don't know. We, we moved from, from a very precise idea of method described most by Bocheński in formal logic, formal logic to, to a slightly chaotic state of the history of logic with respect, not with respect to dealing with the sources. This is, this is uh, there is a high level of skill among historians of logic with respect to, to historical work. But when you deal, when you, when you move to, to the question of involving logic itself, we ended up after, after 100 years in a, in a slightly chaotic state of the history of logic. I tend, I tend to think that the only way, the only way to, to, to achieve a truly mature method of the history of logic is by practice. We have to wait and we have to observe different works of different historians leading to different in different directions. The point is the condition, necessary condition to, to develop the method of the history of logic is to do, to do your steps, your, your the steps in reasoning consciously. So we should require, for instance, for example, when we are asked to evaluate a paper submitted for publication, 
or particularly when we write our papers in the field of the epistemology. We should clearly and strictly describe the method, like in originating sciences, like, like in metaphysics. You should describe what tools you use at every step. And if you evaluate papers or books submitted, you should require it. You should, my experience is we don't do it. So we, we, rely, we rely upon the assumption that the history of logic has already become a mature branch of knowledge, which I hope shortly, I hope I shortly present that is not absolute. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor. And so we have uh, something like uh, eight minutes for discussion. So, are there any questions or comments to Professor Patrick's talk? Uh, our online participants, do you have any questions or comments? Yes. Uh, if you uh, if you want uh, everyone to hear the question, you just have to come here. Yes. <laughs> now I'm speaking to the speaker. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. A question from the front of doing the history of ancient logic, which happens to be my field. Would you accept the following distinction, namely that we cannot presume that an author has accepted a principle that that author did not identify as such. That's the subject side, I think, of your history. And my thinking is this, uh, of course, our sources for the Stoics are horrible. Texas Empiricus yes. hated the Stoics, Diogenes. Not even a Stoic. He wasn't even a Stoic. Diogenes is just basically somebody who you know, writes something like uh, silly newspapers uh, about philosophers and antiquity. So these are not very good sources for Stoic logic, but uh, they we cannot presume they have accepted a principle that they might have tried to avoid had they known it was a principle. Um, so ex falso quadlibit, what you're calling Ocean, um, is a principle that they clearly um, wished to avoid on certain occasions. Now, you've given us an argument for the claim that certain other commitments that they had entail that principle. But wouldn't we rather be charitable by saying that if they had understood that these commitments entail that principle, they may have revised those Oh, thank you for, uh, for an interesting question. I would be tempted to agree with, with your thesis. However, point one, what you have done involves hypothesizing. So it, it is always debatable whether they would try to avoid the principle or not. It is a matter of debate. I, I didn't have enough time to deal with those uh, historical arguments um, against its false support debate in the ancient history, but they are highly debated. So it, the first point, I, I, I am tempted to agree with you, but point one, it is, it is always debatable because it is a far induction. When, when, you, when you try to feel what the, the author of the source, or even not necessarily, as you mentioned, the author, but a, another logician described in the source with better or worse understanding, would avoid or not. And the point, too, is if we simply accept as a methodical rule in the field of the history of logic, we may, we may well argue that Gottlob Frege would certainly 
wants to avoid ways of reasoning leading to the contradiction. Uh, to, to, this, to, to the discovery of the contradiction is his, in his axiomatic work. Uh, forgive me the trivial example, but if you, if you treat the principle as a methodological general principle, you could use it to establish the thesis that you should believe even Frege, uh, volume from Gazette, volume one, I think. So I, I, I feel, my feelings, uh, my feelings sympathize with you, but I think I, I find serious difficulties in applying uh, the principle you mentioned as a general methodological rule. Okay, thank you. And perhaps some questions from our, um, our guests uh, online. Professor Świętorzecka looks as she wanted to ask something <laughs> now. <laughs> okay, so, so I want to say only uh, uh, to Marcin, thank you very much for your interesting uh, talk. It was really great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, perhaps I would just switch the camera there. <laughs> okay. You say uh, any theology does not consist. Then uh, why we continue to use it? Continuity. We know it is not consistent, but we use and we teach this logic in our course. No, 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 not Frege's logic. Frege's logic, more or less, roughly speaking, Frege's logic is what what is contained in the Griffiths. 1879, and it is perfectly correct. Uh, Grundgesetze, their arithmetic, it was designed as a huge three volume work um, proving the truth of logicism, the thesis that mathematics contains only analytical, analytical statements belonging directly to logic itself. And this, this theory, deducing mathematical principles, most of the principles of arithmetics, Schrager doesn't use actually openly set theory as a mediator, but it is set theory is involved silently in the work. But he the, the objective of Grundgesetze is to deduce mathematical principles from out of logical axioms. And uh, the ax, Frege's axiom five Axiom 5, which is rela closely related to what we call the comprehension principle, leads to the contradiction to, to, the, uh, to, uh, to the Russell's, uh, Russell's antinomy, Russell's paradox. Not, not, not what we call Schrager's logic. So we, we don't we don't use we don't use it, it is it is inconsistent definitely and we don't use it anymore and if we teach it I teach it I I, I give a lecture in set theory I teach it only to deliver ways of healing the contradictions on the next lecture as an example of of, of unsuccessful attempt to create a theory so it is not logic it is it is something Frege, well, on the other hand, Frege thought it was logic. He thought it was logic, but we, we don't call it Frege's logic. When we think of Frege's logic, we mostly, we mostly mean classical logical calculus, not necessarily of the first part. Great. Thank you once again uh, for the talk and for, for the attention. discussion. And now let me introduce our second speaker. Uh, it's uh, Colin King uh, from Providence College and the uh, Second Association University of Basel. And the uh, title of uh, Colin's talk is Reforming Aristotle's Logic in New Manos. <laughs> Um, so I just have to find my presentation here, and then I just have to 
over here. Share that. So here. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Brozek, for inviting me and for organizing this conference. I'm very grateful to be here for many reasons. Um, but I think in the spirit of the remarks of uh, your colleague and the current president of the Polish Society for Philosophy, we should all just be grateful that we have our freedom to talk about these things. Uh, it doesn't come for free, as we know. Um, and, uh, we need to be watchful that we deserve it, no matter where we are. Um, I come to this topic from the history of ancient logic, uh, and actually um, the historical awareness uh, that the Lvov Warsaw School requires of us has led me as an ancient magician, as it were, to study the history of the reception of ancient logic because it is clear to me that the history of the reception of ancient logic colors our understanding of what ancient logic itself is. And that's how I became involved in Brentano's school, Brentano being a very influential modern Aristotelian whose views on what Aristotle thought um, are interesting, I think in many ways also wrong, but interestingly wrong. Um, and uh, I and relating Lukasiewicz today to Brentano, I'm including Lukasiewicz as it were in the greater school of Brentano, uh, and how that works, I'll explain in the course of my talk. Um, my, uh, let's see, to change the slides, do I just go down? Oh, there we go. I can just go to. If I want to go to full screen. Oh, maybe it's a video. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 there we go. Here we go. And then I can switch that. Okay. Um, I'm talking about logic reform, and logic reform, as you may know, was a movement uh, at around the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. The idea was roughly logic needs to change, it needs to be updated certain reasons, and there are different kinds of logic reform. Here's one type that we get from the anti-Aristotelian Alfred Sidgwick, who writes in mind at the end of the 19th century, almost everyone would admit that the technical terms of what is usually taught as logic are to a great extent survivals from philosophies now very largely superseded. Logic bristles with terms that have sunk out of use as argument has ceased to be a game with rules laid down by authority. Well, that's him basically complaining about the way um, that uh, Aristotle's logic was reinstated in the 19th century in Oxford as the default setting um, for logicians. And uh, the idea here is that we need to clear up logic, free it from all these um, remnants of authority, and also update it with the best metaphysics, for example, that we have. Now, this basically is the program from a lot of different people, but of course they will disagree on what kind of an update logic means. Here's uh, my translation of a manuscript um, that was edited by Abba Ben Molina um, uh, from Brentano's Elementare Logik manuscript. The manuscript itself is in the uh, library in Harvard. Um, there, Brentano says, and this is my translation of his German, some define logic as the art of thinking, others say that it's the art of inference and of consequence in the broadest sense, but I should rather, in taking the middle way between these two descriptions, call it the art of judgment. This is, as it were, squarely the old logic, the pre-mathematical logic. For logic in the traditional and common sense of the word teaches us the procedure which leads to knowledge of the truth, i.e. to correct judgment, for truth lies in judgment, Correct judgment is knowledge. Now, even if Brentano is squarely in the old tradition of logic on this account, he does have an interesting logic reform that he thinks um, he can pursue based on a scientific theory of judgment. And I'm going to talk about that theory in a second. But let's contrast this with yet another type of logic reform, 
logic reform as we find it in Jan Kasiewicz. I'm just going to freely translate his German. Um, unfortunately, I don't know his Polish. Um, but this is, a, I think, a very important article in academics from 1935. Um, and uh, I'll just freely translate this. Modern logistic has taught us to distinguish um, within formal logic two basic disciplines that could uh, hardly be more unlike each other, just as uh, arithmetic is different from geometry, namely the disciplines of propositional logic and name logic, that's of course predicate logic. All uh, older authors uh, that have written about the history of logic were unaware of this fundamental difference between propositional logic and predicate logic. And to this very day, there is no history of propositional logic, and therefore there is no correct representation or presentation of the history of formal logic at all. And then this programmatic statement, the history of logic must be written anew by a historian who controls logistic, that is, the new logic. That's Jan Lukasiewicz from 1935. Now, of course, uh, people can get outrun by the programs that they create. Uh, the current state of the art in understanding, say, Aristotle's logic has overthrown Lukasiewicz's own view of uh, the syllogistic as being um, a system of theses. Now we think of Aristotle's syllogistic in terms of a natural deduction type system by uh, Gensen or Yadowski, but um, that just goes to show that Jan Lukasiewicz was right, um, namely that we do need a history of logic from the perspective of modern formal logic. As a matter of fact, on this front, Jan Lukasiewicz definitely won even if his particular uh, interpretation got conquered in, shall we say, the competition uh, for interpreting ancient logic from a modern point of view. Now, I would like to suggest that his own particular interpretation of Aristotle's logic was driven by this distinction that he places so much uh, emphasis on, namely the distinction between proposition and predicate logic. This is kind of a parallel passage that we find in this fine book, um, Aristotle's syllogistic from the standpoint of modern formal logic. To this day, there exists no exact logical analysis of the proofs Aristotle gives to reduce the imperfect syllogism to the perfect. The old historians of logic, like Kant and Maya, were philosophers and knew only the philosophical logic, which in the 19th century, with very few exceptions, was below a scientific level. No one can fully understand Aristotle's proofs who does not know that there exists, besides the Aristotelian system, another system of logic more fundamental than the theory of the syllogism. It is the logic of propositions. Now, I don't want to fault Bukasiewicz for the fact that he overlooked some very important and interesting propositional logical theses in Aristotle's topics. By the way, Bochensky notices them and includes them in his formal logic as non-analytic theses a grab bag of things that he didn't know what to do with. Um, that's not uh, so interesting. More interesting is how uh, this view um, comes uh, into play um, as a kind of constraint for Lukasiewicz's own interpretation in this book. I think it's a constraint that he could have done without, but that's another matter. What I want to talk about today is how Lukasiewicz himself um, tries to do a new history of logic based on a scientific principle, something like the object logic that my previous speaker was talking about. Um, but this object logic is also, as it so happens, a logic of objects and based on a certain theory of objects uh, that comes from the Brentano school. And yes, I mean my not. So we're going to get to that in just a moment. Um, that will be at the very end of this talk. And I apologize. Now I'm going to subject you to a rather long text in a short amount of time so that I can get through. Um, so just buckle your seatbelts. Here we go now through first Brentano's logic. Now it's a little embarrassing that Franz Brentano 
uh, explicitly positions himself against logicism in the second volume of psychology from an empirical point of view. There he says, and so as much as I sympathize in general with the attempts to make the postulates of elementary logic clear and to facilitate their operations, I'm far from being able to approve of these attempts at mathematics sizing logic, it's him shaking his finger at Husserl, and I object when my attempt to reduce categorical statements, Aussage, into existential statements is confused with such attempts. But we'll just see how we should understand this attempt um, in a minute. When we earlier spoke of those who give the object of logic an exaggerated gen generality, we must tell those who think that all judgments with which logic is concerned treat of equations and other quantitative relations that they make the opposite. If they limit the task of logic too much and wish to make it a part of mathematics, whereas it seems to me that, to the contrary, all of mathematics seems to be a part of logic. Now, that could just be uh, uh, a little Auseinandersetzung, as we would say in German, with Husserl. I think it has more interesting consequences if you think about how he tries to use a theory of judgment to reform and reformulate uh, Aristotelian theses. This is well known, um, but still interesting. This is how uh, Brentano interprets um, the Aristotelian logical constants, as Mukasiewicz calls them, A, E, uh, I, and O. I, A belongs to sub B, that's how Aristotle would put it. Brentano, an A, B exists. It's an existential judgment with the complex object A, B. E, A belongs to no B. Brentano, no A, B exists. Or a negative judgment about the complex object A, B. O, A does not belong to some B. Brentano reformulates a non-AB exists, or there exists at least one complex object with the features non-AB. And A, A belongs to all or every B, no non-AB exists, or I am hereby negating the existence of the complex object non-AB. Interesting in this is he reformulates uh, all of these kinds of we would say there are two of all quantified statements here from an Aristotelian point of view, namely E and A. He reformulates everything with the existential quantifier and a complex object. Interesting. Why do you need that? Why is it good? We'll get back to that in a moment. Then there's the double ju uh, judgment theory. So he thinks that in the dictum de omne et de nulo, we basically have two judgments each time. So if we say A belongs to all B, we're committed to both the judgment and A exists, and that there is no non-A B. And if we say A belongs to no B, we're still committed to an A existing, and we're denying that there is an A B. So the double judgment theory, now this would seem very circuitous, this is not the way I would introduce my students to the syllogistic, right? I mean, that's not how we think, or that's at least not, the, as it were, the logical use that we put um, the dictum de omni de nulo to. So what gives? Why is this um, supposed to help? And by the way, uh, this seems to be a very extensionalist reading of the dictum. And uh, nowadays, uh, it's hotly debated, but a lot of people are non-orthodox in terms of the dictum de omni. So Ben Morrison, uh, Marco Malik, and even myself, I tend towards a non-extensionalist reading of the dictum de omni de nulo. And Mario Minucci already gave us some good reasons way back in 1996 to um, think of the dictum perhaps not as a statement about the relation of classes, uh, as you would say it, see it described, say, by Betts and Mates. Well. The background to this judgment interpretation of um, the syllogistic and its thesis is, of course, an epistemological one. And Brentano was concerned with a certain problem um, in inference. 
here and I'm, I'm translating freely from a book that's probably not by Brentano called Die Lehre vom Richtigen Urteil. The book was basically put together uh, posthumously like so many of Brentano's works um, from dedicated students who often found it good to put their own writings into a book with Franz Brentano's name on it. So you have to be very careful when you cite from these books. But we'll just say it's by Franz Brentano. There he writes, immediate knowings, that's what I'm calling a kettisit, in order to uh, recognize the act uh, that's involved. Immediate knowings are simply insights regarding facts from inner perception and those analytic judgments which are grasped as true upon the basis of concepts. In order for something to be immediate knowing, it must be exactly proven, i.e. it must be inferred from immediate judgments of the understanding in a way which is certain. This becomes evident when one takes into account what the evaluation of a derived judgment or proof includes. It includes. The evaluation of the premises of the proof, which in the last instance must be immediately evident through truths, and the evaluation of the correctness of the inferences. So the tying together of uh, syllogistic uh, logical constants with forms of judgment um, provides, as it were, a dialogue board or a record uh, with regard to which one can track the correctness of inferences. Thus, my hypothesis, at least, um, with regard to uh, Brentano's project in reformulating uh, Arist Aristotelian relations in this way. That's just the German, in case you want to see it. And then he develops this thesis, that the epistemic root of deduction is an immediate judgment. He writes, the first aforementioned step is clearly to be taken according to the rules of the evaluation of immediately evident truths. In principle, so is the second, namely the checking of uh, the inferences. For when is an inference justified? If it is evident that the assertion that the premises are true, the conclusion is false and is absurd, i.e. that it contains a contradiction. When then it is immediately evident that it is impossible that the premises be true and the conclusion false, our semantic uh, definition of deductive validity. This impossibility must, must either be evident immediately from the concepts involved, then the law of inference is an axiom, or it must be made evident on the basis of inferences, the validity of which is immediately evident, i.e. from immediately evident principles. Now, this may sound rather Cartesian, this evidence that he's invoking, and of course people who have read psychology from an empirical point of view can be um, given for thinking that this was a text written under the influence of a certain sort of Cartesian uh, tradition. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, he thinks that the epistemic root of deduction is in fact something uh, intersubjective. This is Brentano reformulating uh, what was probably uh, originally his reading of Aristotle's Metaphysics Gamma and I don't mean the first part of Metaphysics Gamma where Aristotle puts up the three versions of the principle of non-contradiction that you find uh, discussed in Lukasiewicz's famous book. I mean the later version um, where we are already talking with Protagoras about why somebody would ever want to reject the principle of non-contradiction. Uh, and so here Brentano formulates an interesting intersubjective version of what he thinks is the epistemic root of deduction namely an intersubjective form of the principle of non-contradiction. There he says, the principle of certain inferences is the principle of contradiction, which one finds expressed in various ways, expressed in the correct form the law states, it is impossible that one who denies what another correctly accepts, denies it correctly, and, which is impossible that, one who accepts something that another correctly rejects, accepts it correctly, under the condition that they both present it with the same mode of presentation and the same mode of judgment. That's rather torturous, uh, but I think it's supposed to reflect uh, something like, and this is, I thank Venancio for this reference, something like Aristotle's formulation when he says, and we add all the objections that the sophists usually bring. Right. Uh, so, we add all qualifications that are necessary so that this holds intersubjectively, that is, it holds um, 
in all circumstances. Now, interestingly enough, he also says something similar in another part of this very problematic book called Die Lehre vom Richtigen Urteil, where he says, um, this is supposed to be from a text called Our Axioms. Let's see if I translated this for you. No, I didn't, so I'll paraphrase this. We want to now uh, speak about the most important classes of axioms, the law of contradiction, i.e. our law of non-contradiction. It is impossible that someone who denies something which another correctly, that is with evidence, accepts, denies it correctly, etc. Now, what's this deal with evidence? Why does he add this one word? What importance uh, does evidence have? By the way, this is just the um, three, these are the three versions of the principle. Um, in a brief article, I actually take issue with Lukasiewicz because I think these three principles are quite distinct and have, well, Lukasiewicz pointed out that they're distinct, but I think that they're distinct in a way which is not as problematic as Lukasiewicz thinks they were, but that's another story. Let's get to the bottom of the story about evidence. Now, here I'm going to turn to an article by Joran Sundholm. Um, you've probably heard of his uh, paper on the century of judgment and inference. He's published various papers on this problem. Um, this is his explanation for why Brentano has recourse to the concept of evidence. He says, because, and this is Joran Sundholm, I'm not quoting, because of his distaste for all Platonist notions in, in logic, such as Bolzano's proposition in itself, Brentano rejected the single unary form of judgment that ascribes truth to a Platonist content. Instead, he canvassed two unary forms of judgment, namely alpha is, or alpha is not, we've seen how he does that already, where alpha is a general concept. Brentano, however, was not the first to note this. Already, Bolzano explicitly considered these forms under the guises of A has, alpha has not emptiness and alpha has emptiness. Young man Brentano construed evidence as experience of truth, at Leibniz der Wahrheit, when the order of dependence goes from truth to evidence. Later, under pressure from the phenomenon of blind judgment, he reversed this order of priority and held that truth, i.e. correctness, should be seen as possibility for evident judgment. And he writes, truth pertains to the judgment of he who judges right, that is, to the judgment of him who judges with someone who would judge with who judge, judge with evidence, that is, he who asserts what would be asserted also by someone judging with evidence. Now, the implications of this uh, judging with evidence is this. He's worried about the warrant, as we would say, for making a certain um, judgment. And if you frame logic in terms of judgment, this is a problem that you have. Of course, it's an epistemological problem that you don't have if you think of inference in terms of simply implication or logical consequence. So of course, Brentano with his epistemology of inference is um, part and parcel of the problem of older logic. And he's epistemologizing the steps that we take between certain uh, mental acts. And Lukasiewicz sees this clearly and will reject it. Um, but the uh, the matter is actually slightly more involved um, because uh, the psychologizing with regard to the principle of non-contradiction that comes so naturally to Brentano actually gets into um, Bukasiewicz's own discussion of the principle of non-contradiction and that, with that I'm going to lead over to the second and last part of my talk. Now, there, Although uh, Ukasiewicz has dismissive things to say about Heinrich Meyer, I want to tell you here today that Heinrich Meyer is not as bad as his reputation. Uh, Heinrich Meyer, a student of Siegbart, was actually quite an astute reader of Aristotle. He knew the source as well, and he uh, was not naive logically. He had actually a pretty good um, eye for what uh, the general project of Aristotle's logic and metaphysics was. Now, it's still highly controversial whether Aristotle's logic was metaphysical in the way that Maya thought it was. 
um, but that's uh, that need not be discussed here today. And um, what Vukasevich picks up from Heinrich Meyer, if you turn to his 1910 um, essay from the Bulletin International de l'Académie des Sciences de Cracovie, is uh, the idea that the principle of non-contradiction is said to hold about opposite property predicates for a thinker. Um, I've given you what uh, Heinrich Meyer says. I'm just going to uh, cite what Lukasiewicz takes out of it, namely, folglich können zwei kontradiktorischen Aussagen entsprechende Glaubensakte nicht zugleich in demselben Bewusstsein bestehen. Now, he is taking up this interpretation from Meyer, and he's going to use it to actually criticize Aristotle. And the, the interpretation of Meyer is quite of a piece um, with Brentano. Both Meyer and Brentano believe that, say, the principle of non-contradiction is the firmest axiom of Aristotle's system. Now, if you go to, say, the prior analytics and you just read the prior analytics, I think you have to be kind of crazy to think that the principle of non-contradiction is the axiom of that system. Maybe the dictum de omne et de nullum, nullo is the axiom of that system, but the dictum does not have any clear recourse to the principle of non-contradiction. So this reform of Aristotle's logic is quite radical in my view. I don't think that you'll find any reason in the text of Aristotle to say that the principle of non-contradiction is axiomatic, but whatever. Um, Lukasiewicz goes on to criticize Aristotle. And now this is interesting because Aristotle is actually looking more and more like Franz Brentano to me. But let's see how it goes. In der psychologischen Untersuchung der Glaubensakte, so in his psychological investigation of acts of belief or acts of acceptance in the Interpretation of Routine, Aristotle makes the very common mistake of logicism in psychology which may serve as the counterpart to psychologism in logic. Instead of properly inquiring about psychological functions, the Staggerite um, looks at the propositions that correspond to these psychological functions and their respective logical relations. And um, what becomes evident is that he refers to acts of acceptance Glaubensakte as true or false, although acts of acceptance, qua psychic functions, uh, are um, just as little describable in terms of true and false as feelings, emotions, um, etc. Okay, interesting in all this is that uh, Aristotle and this description has come to be a kind of, well, typical representative of the Brentano school. So in some ways, maybe Lukasiewicz's reaction and criticism of Aristotle has more to say about immediate predecessors in the Brentano school. But, be that as it may, I've got one more thing here. Doesn't want to give me the intermediate number. This is just Peter Simons who uh, very correctly identifies the presence of another element from the Brentano school in Lukasiewicz's criticism of Aristotle. As you probably all well know, uh, Meinong makes a certain appearance in Lukasiewicz's writing at this point. And Lukasiewicz basically invokes Meinong's theory of objects as, as it were, the correct or neutral ontology with which one must work if one are if one is to uh, talk about logical principles. Um, I'm citing here Simons, who says, Lukasiewicz equates Meinong's theory of objects with ontology in the traditional Aristotelian sense, and also claims that the primary bearers of truth and falsity are not sentences of a language, but what they signify, namely objective facts, Meinong's objective, which are being or non-being, the sign or the nicht sign, or else of being so or not being so of objects, a so sein or a nicht so sein von Gegenstand. The terminology here is totally Meinongian. Now, this has an interesting consequence that I think um, we can uh, use for our discussion. Let's see if I can get to this last slide. Um, 
This basically puts Aristotle in a Minongian jungle, the so-called Minongian jungle, where uh, we have these kooky objects uh, that do not exist. And um, the result, of course, is anachronistic. Right? I mean, I don't think that anybody uh, who works in ancient philosophy would agree with the claim that um, Aristotle must justify his ontology vis-a-vis -a, -vis a position of kooky objects, or vis-a-vis -a, -vis a position where there are Minongian objects. And yet, Aristotle has been thrust into the domain of kooky objects by this logical um, study, or this study of his um, logic from a formal, that is, from a modern formal standpoint. Is that a licit move? Does that help us understand Aristotle? Or what help, what, how does that help us get um, better results with regard to Aristotelian thesis. Um, that's an open question that I pose to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colin. And are there any questions or comments for this lecture? You, you get to sit here. Thank you very much for an interesting job. I just want to ask you, but you also track this chart of the mm -hmm. of Bentonism in Russia, which also in this later book, you the one you mentioned. Yeah, so it's not just a core, it's just the case of the first one. Ah, good question. I didn't check Aristotle's syllogistic for his commitments, but of course the relevant part of that book would be the modal logic, um, because that's where the ontological commitments get controversial. Um, I don't think that he's a Minongian in his interpretation of Aristotle's modal logic, so I would say that this Minongian position was kind of ad hoc and limited to the discussion of the Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. It is uh, important at the beginning of your discuss and to explain the, the difficult dispensation. Why it is important in this time when many scholars are working at the new logic, mathematical logic, to have a reform of an Aristotelian logic, which uh, many people think it is just traditional logic, it is we know the part of it. Or, I think it is important to explain why it is important because it seems they will reform something which is uh, no more so important. And then I have uh, two more remarks about this superlogismus uh, in uh, logic, and I think. Uh, you mean logicism in psychology or psychologism? Psychologismus in logic. Okay. And uh, when um, uh, when Lukashevich speaks about this um, psycho uh, psychological formulation of the principle of contradiction, and I think we can make in this uh, case the same operation which links with Aristotle. If we use our knowledge, we can uh, see in this part of. Uh, Metaphysics from Marie, the what we now call logic of beliefs, the plastic one. Because what Aristotle says is that in this case, uh, when I have to do with beliefs, uh, the proposition are not contradictory but contradictory. Because it is a third if there is a third possibility. And uh, what is uh, 
in this case also important uh, uh, is that I exploded the always the the assignment proposition which are indigent contributors. It doesn't take into consideration an hidden contribution, which is not so evident. Like, for example, in a legacy system, you have to search the contribution and only after a long study you can detect it. And this idea because you did mention Bolzano, it's uh, explained by Bolzano that you can have also contradiction in system which are not so evident. In this case, I can have uh, in my mind two contradictory grounding factors. But I am, I, am, I am not aware of it. Of course, and we all no. do. Like, yeah. No, I mean, yeah. Uh, it would be. Um, so I'd like to just say that it's about acceptance states because I'm a little uncomfortable with the concept of belief, but that has other reasons. Um, let me just accept what you said in the, in the second part and talk about what you asked first, namely, why reform Aristotle's logic if nobody cares anymore? Well, I mean, if you even read the uh, rule, the laws of thought, what he first does, and maybe it's a rhetorical thing, but certainly striking to say, well, I can do the mental operations of election and explain syllogistic that way. And everybody's doing this. Everybody's saying, my logic is good because I can do what the syllogistic does. This is not just a rhetorical move, I take it. This is really people showing that their system has, is powerful enough to capture the logical content of the syllogistic. That's proof that your system is good. Then what you get to do is talk about what underlies uh, the syllogistic. And this is a game that people are playing right now in the history of ancient logic. I have to review a book which, talk, which is all about Aristotle's underlying logic. Right? This is a, pro a program or a project of Corcoran, recently deceased colleague in the history of ancient logic, John Corcoran thought that Aristotle had an underlying logic, and he wanted to explain the completeness and compactness of the syllogistic system using this underlying logic. I think a lot of people then try to explain or show what underlies the syllogistic as well. So it's not that the syllogistic is just dead. Everybody sort of has this idea that it's going to be superseded. But the way that you supersede it is both by showing that you can do everything that it does and explaining why it does what it does. That's why I think the syllogistic becomes such a hot topic precisely in the time when it's being talked about. Thank you. I think we have still time for one question. Professor Yandaski. Yes. Please turn on, turn on your microphone. Uh, my remark concerns not to your uh, very interesting paper, but um, to some opinion of, of uh, Peter Simons, cited by you, yeah. namely that according to Kashevich, uh, the primary bearer of, of truth and force, uh, bears are objects of the world. For me, it is, it can be considered only as a metaphor because what, do, what uh, does it mean uh, truth or false? Truth is either uh, a certain um, uh, property of sentences or uh, truth through sentences simply. And if we say that, that uh, well, uh, world objects are uh, the bearer of truth, well, it makes no sense. And it is impossible that it is Lukashevich's opinion. What do you think about this objection? I, 
I would tend to agree, since Lukasiewicz was such a clear-headed magician, and uh, magicians tend to think of truth and falsehood in terms of propositions and not in terms of objects, although, I mean, there is that uh, bit in Aristotle, uh, also discussed in Brentano's dissertation, about true and false uh, in being. Um, I don't think, I think that's too far a reference uh, for Lukasiewicz. I don't know if Lukasiewicz was as committed to Meinomian objects as uh, Peter Simons uh, says, but he does use them to some effect in that article from 1910. So, I mean, uh, to go back to my predecessor, should we do subject or object history here on Lukasiewicz? Should we presume that he really was accepting Meinong's theory of objects, or should we rather presume that he was simply using it um, for a certain uh, argumentative end? I tend to the latter. Thank you. Uh, thank you once again for recording the talk you spoke and for the discussion. We are almost perfectly on, uh, on time, and uh, it's a great uh, advantage of uh, logicians' presentations <laughs> that uh, they are usually strictly in, in time. And now it's time for uh, about 18 minutes break. Uh, we have coffee here, and we will see you in um, at 12. Okay, so see you. Uh, excuse me, Professor Brozek, we cannot hear you here in online session. Okay, so once again, uh, we are starting after the break and our first speaker is Professor uh, Andrzej Indrzejczak. And now uh, <coughs> we are sharing the screen. Okay, so let me, let me say once again, thank you for, uh, for uh, invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to have an opportunity to recall uh, some achievements of Stanisław Jaszkowski, a member of, uh, of Warsaw uh, School, maybe not uh, as well known as uh, his teachers like Lukasiewicz or, or Leśniewski, but anyway, he had also uh, some important things. Uh, in particular, in the field of the formalization uh, of the formalization of uh, natural uh, forms of reasoning, well known from the uh, antiquity, uh, at least among the mathematicians, but also in the, in the argumentation. And <clears throat> what I mean by this. Uh, Natural uh, representation of reasoning is uh, maybe simpler uh, called natural deduction systems uh, commonly. And uh, let me uh, I don't know, maybe I did something wrong. Uh, With Stanisław Jaszkowski, uh, together, but independently of, of uh, Gerhard Gensen, was uh, an inventor of natural deduction systems. And uh, his, uh, uh, his uh, interest was in the uh, his interest was in the providing some formal representation of several ways of reasoning. Uh, something wrong with uh, uh, Yes, we, because it's, it's empty. Your slides are empty. Perhaps you can... Ah, maybe I... Uh, sorry. Sorry, 
work on these programs. We will try to resolve it. Perhaps it was just only uh, saved on, on the laptop that's trying to answer them. Only the first slide is. Here's another copy. This will work. I hope this will be not empty. Sorry for this. <laughs> One word. Sorry, sorry <laughs> for the embarrassing technical problems. Uh, uh, the schedule of, of, of my talk. At first, I will say uh, something about Stanislaw Gieszkowski, his uh, scientific career, very briefly, and then uh, I will try to describe more briefly what is natural deduction system. And. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, what was the specific uh, specific features of the Yashkovsky approach? In particular, uh, when opposed to Gensen, as I mentioned, they independently uh, uh, founded the, the, the first <coughs> system of natural deduction. And also, because it was, uh, as, as I said, Yashkovsky was a uh, uh, pupil of, of Leśniec, of uh, uh, Łukasiewicz, the most, but also he, he knew the works of Leśniecki, is also maybe uh, worth uh, noting uh, as a part of the digression that uh, in, uh, in the uh, background of the Lvov Warsaw School, there were some other attempts to uh, maybe not to formulate precisely what is natural deduction system, but to use some kind of natural deduction system without uh, explaining exactly what's going on. And in particular, it is visible in uh, several papers of, of Leśniewski. So if I found the time for this, I, I, I will also uh, uh, make some illustration of that. Uh, let's uh, say easier. Uh, let's say something about Jaszkowski. Uh, he started uh, his studies in mathematics in Warsaw and uh, 24 and uh, then uh, he was involved in the uh, Łukasiewicz seminar and uh, Łukasiewicz posed the problem how to uh, provide a formal justification of these traditional forms of reasoning used since antiquity. And, uh, very, uh, and at the same year, uh, Jaszkowski provided uh, a solution to, to, to this problem. And then the next year he was presenting in, uh, in Krakow, uh, in, uh, in Lwów. And uh, then he had some uh, some uh, problems with, with his health and uh, uh, long break in studies. Uh, but uh, finally, uh, he got his uh, uh, doctor's degree in uh, thirty two, and in uh, thirty four it was published. And this was this is the presentation of his uh, natural deduction system. Uh, then, after the Second World War, he was very active in the organization uh, of the uh, uh, University of, of Nicolaus uh, Copernicus. Uh, he was, in particular, uh, one of uh, the dean, uh, a prorector, a rector. In the meantime, he got the full professorship. So he was he was very active in his uh, uh, quite short life, and and. In fact, uh, his scientific interest and his achievements, which because I, I, I will focus on natural deduction, but I think it is a good occasion also to say something about his other interests as well. Uh, so 
for, for example, he, he was very creative uh, logician. In particular, uh, in the same paper when uh, where he is presenting natural deduction, this is PhD thesis. Uh, it is in, uh, it is a presentation of the first system of inclusive logic. So it is weaker form because uh, it is. Uh, not like in classical logic that we are assuming that the domains are non-empty. Yeah? So, so some of the classical rules and theses are not valid in the inclusive logic. As Ben Chivenga has noticed, it was in fact almost uh, implicitly uh, a presentation of the first free logic, in fact. So the history of free logic, which is usually the, uh, dated the, for the 50s, yes, should be in fact uh, Formulated uh, and, and uh, Yash, because Yashkowski uh, uh, was, and it was not by mistake, yes, because Yashkowski is uh, very precise in formulating this his logic. He is uh, he is writing that uh, it uh, that that, that uh, uh, saying that uh, the domain must be non-empty, that something must uh, must exist is uh, uh, not dependent on logic. Logic should be independent of. Yes, so that's why he is presenting some weaker system, and uh, also uh, at those times he was uh, uh, presenting matrix uh, characterization of intuitionistic logic. A year before, as far as I remember, Gedder has uh, found that it is not possible to characterize intuitionistic logic in terms of uh, finite matrices, uh, but it was only rather negative uh, uh, result. On the other hand, Yashkowski has provided a very clever construction showing how um, we can characterize intuitionistic logic by the infinite series of finite matrices. Yes, so it, it, it was a positive construction. And uh, after the war, uh, when, when he was working in Torun, he also uh, presented the first uh, version of the paraconsistent logic. It, it was called by him discursive or some, sometimes it is uh, translated as discussive. People are worrying about that. In particular, uh, this year, uh, uh, the beginning of September, was the Congress in Toru, uh, uh, on the Paraconsistent, the sixth Congress on Paraconsistent Logic. And people st still uh, uh, do not agree which form <laughs> should be, <laughs> should be uh, used. And, but this is not a very important thing. He also uh, developed the uh, form of causal logic, uh, and also he was very active in uh, mathematical problems, in particular concerning decidability and uh, undecidability of several uh, theorems. Yes, he, he, he obtained a, um, a lot of, of uh, positive results, and also uh, he was working on he was very strongly interested in geometry and in particular in the uh, similar way as Starsky in the geometry of solids yes and the, because it's a traditional uh, form of Euclidean geometry uh, uh, was uh, taken by him as too abstract yes the, the, the notion of the point and the line were uh, abstract uh, so in brief, these are uh, his most important uh, results obtained in the field of logic and uh, mathematics. But uh, turning back to the natural deduction, there are two theoretical problems in the natural deduction because, first of all, what, did, what, uh, uh, what, kind of, uh, what systems can we uh, uh, call besides the natural deduction? Because sometimes this term is used as a kind of a big bag when you can put almost everything, double system and so, so, so on. Uh, this is too wide, in my opinion, and not only in mine. So we should pre rather precisely uh, describe what uh, criteria uh, the system should satisfy in order to be called the natural deduction system. That, but uh, also, uh, even among uh, genuine natural deduction systems, there is a great variety of the presentation of the, of the forms of the proof for this. Yes? So uh, sometimes uh, students who got with natural deduction from different textbooks are, uh, uh, are very uh, embarrassed. But is it the same or not? Yes, <laughs> because of the sometimes uh, 
different systems of natural deduction for at first sight look very differently. So and uh, let's start with the first problem, the demarcation problem. And for example, Pelletier and Heisen um, uh, has counted at least about 20 criteria of uh, which can be used for uh, making a definition of natural deduction system. For, for, for me, such uh, some of these criteria are not really very important, but in my in my opinion, there are three uh, decisive criteria. First of all, in order to have a natural deduction system, it uh, we should have a possibility in this system uh, for entering assumptions in any stage of the construction of proof, and also some ways for discharging the assumption. Every new uh, arbitrary assumption is starting some kind of a subderivation, yes, and uh, uh, and we should have some ways for um, getting out this subderivation to close it yes and and, and it should be and usually it uh, it requires some kind of technical devices uh, in order to make it explicit because otherwise uh, some imp improper inferences can be made mm, so the, the second criteria is that uh, logical constants uh, are characterized rather, rather by means of rules, not axioms. Uh, it is too hard to say no axioms at all because, okay, let's take equality. Okay, it is possible to characterize uh, it with uh, rules, but it is not natural. <laughs> and we want to, because it is natural to have an, at least one axiom of reflexivity, as it, the, the, the simplest way. So. It is, in my uh, opinion, to 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 sever, to say no axioms at all. Yeah, sometimes sometimes it's better than to have an artificial kind of rules. And uh, so, uh, but anyway, uh, this is the strong demanding, and sometimes it is also made uh, somehow precisely that uh, it should be at least a pair of rules of introduction and elimination of this constant. Yes, into the uh, the proof. And uh, the third one, that uh, in a genuine system uh, of natural deduction, we should be free in the uh, uh, trying to, 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 to apply several uh, different strategies of uh, searching for a proof, direct, indirect, conditional, and so on, by cases. Uh, 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 so uh, these are very broad criteria. Anyway, uh, they rather exclude such, such systems like sequent calculus of Genser or several forms of tableau systems because they do not satisfy something. That they admit only one kind of uh, proof strategy, in fact. Yes, and for example, when we take a look at tableau, uh, in the standard tableau, it is only indirect proofs and elimination rules. In the dual tableau, yes, well, well developed in the Warsaw University, on the other hand, on the direct proof and uh, uh, again elimination rules. Yeah, so uh, this is not this is not natural deduction. This is nice in use, but this is not natural deduction. Yeah, and uh, the other theoretical problem is a close relationship between natural deduction system, sequent calculus, and W systems, and uh, of course, but this is another another thing uh, which does not interest. Us, uh, today. And the, uh, among this uh, wide class of several uh, natural deduction systems, okay, we have also we should have also some uh, uh, forms of, of dividing into into the uh, some some subgroups. Uh, for instance, formula systems and sequence systems. It means that uh, some systems, uh, the most popular uh, systems of natural deduction. Uh, use rules which are uh, defined on formulas. Yeah, but on the other hand, it is possible also to use sequence as a main objects. And I don't mean by this sequence calculus of Gensen, but but uh, natural deduction which is using uh, sequence. It is not exhaustive uh, 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 because, for instance, that may be some other uh, kind of uh, building blocks in the. Um, mm -hmm. Many years ago, I was playing with some kinds of a natural deduction where the objects 
on which uh, rules were de defined were uh, finite sets of formulas in the uh, some generalized uh, clauses in the sense that these sets were interpreted disjunctively. And also, uh, in particular, when we use these formula systems, uh, usually it is uh, uh, necessary to make a division between inference rules, which just uh, infer some new formulas from some uh, formulas which are already in the proof. And also some proof construction rules, uh, which uh, correspond to something like, uh, you know, uh, the proof from conditional proof or, or proof by cases. Yeah, so it's, it's more involved uh, construction because uh, it is defined not only on formulas but also on uh, uh, global on the on the on the proof. Uh, and very important thing, uh, the main difference between Yashkowski and Jensen approach the format of proof. And two main formats are linear and tree. Uh, Gelsen was using trees, uh, Jaszkowski was using linear format. In fact, um, uh, linear does not necessarily uh, mean that we have only the sequence, linear sequence like in axiomatic proofs. Because in, uh, in fact, in Jaszkowski approach, this is rather a family of nested, uh, of nested sequences, yes, one, uh, so it is much more rich, the richer structure. And um, there are also two uh, related problems concerning history of natural deduction. When uh, such systems first appear and uh, when they started to be used as a common form of teaching logic. In, uh, for instance, in Anglo-Saxon uh, textbooks, uh, it's a very common way of presentation of, of, of logic, yes? And, in Poland, maybe in European tradition, maybe not so uh, so often found. Uh, but there are two different uh, problems uh, related, but different. Uh, maybe I will skip the prehistory, the stories we can discuss if this it was a kind of natural deduction system or, or no. We have um, so poor basis text text basis for for deciding. Of what's, what's going on that it is where uh, you know, discussing things. Also, some scholars said that in uh, peers, uh, uh, in particular unpublished uh, papers, you can find something like natural deduction. I am very skeptical about this. It's a rather kind of a diagrammatic system. It's, it's quite different. It's not natural deduction. Mm. Uh, Jacques Herbert is very uh, important uh, because it is uh, he provided the formal um, proof of uh, deduction theorem, which is one of the genuine techniques of natural deduction. And on the other hand, in Tarski uh, used uh, natural uh, uh, deduction theorem, also indirect deduction theorem, and some uh, other rules of, in, uh, of uh, which are popular in natural deduction systems as a uh, con uh, as uh, axioms of this consequence operation theory. Yeah? So this is also, uh, in a sense, involved. And uh, about Leśniewski, I will say uh, something later. And uh, uh, it is quite uh, interesting that Kurt Gödel, uh, his known publication were, uh, ha have nothing to do with natural deduction. But on the other hand, when uh, some curses in the 30s uh, he had in logic, and it was shown by uh, Costa, Doshen, and Nandzic that they involved some form of natural deduction. And also, what is even more important, uh, von Plato, quite recently, three years ago, he published the, 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 the paper as far as I remember, he found in some uh, notes of Gedel uh, from 20s that he was uh, using a kind of natural deduction for himself, yes, to, 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 to present the proofs with, without closer uh, characterization. So uh, it, the history of natural deduction, uh, the, the, the new one should, should take it into account as well. Uh, and also Hertz is a very important person because he was, uh, uh, he was using sequence uh, with, and, and the, the first uh, papers of Gensen were developing his idea, and then he he, he was applying a sequence not only for the um, construction of sequence calculus, which was rather at first 
some kind of auxiliary technical uh, system, but also uh, in 36, in his paper on the consistency of arithmetic, he was using uh, natural deduction in uh, the defined of on, on sequence. And um, as for his story, as I said, 26, it should be uh, it should be taken as the, the first year when the, the official form of natural deduction is presented. And 34, 35, two break, uh, groundbreaking uh, papers of, of Jaszkowski and Gensen, first official publications. And then uh, 60, uh, 36, I, I have mentioned this one. But when this first textbook presentation, this is a very interesting thing and also connected very strongly with Jaszkowski. Because I am pretty sure that the first textbook uh, where logic is presented by means of natural deduction system is the script of Jaszkowski from 37 for the student of mathematical faculty in, uh, in Toru. Uh, three years ago, I, I have uh, uh, prepared the, the, the critical reduction of this because my opinion is one, one of the very, very original uh, textbook, uh, not, not well known. And in particular, as far as I know, there are only three examples in Poland uh, in very bad condition in a few years, there will be nothing from that spot. So, so I must say I'm proud <laughs> that uh, with the help of the colleagues from uh, Torun, I, I, I uh, made a kind of renovation of this text. Okay, mm, uh, so uh, this is uh, well-known uh, books, uh, is quite methods of logic and, and Fitch. In particular Fitch, because in methods of logic, there are only some uh, small chapter or two chapters, it depends on which edition we, uh, we have in mind. And uh, so Quine is not treating uh, natural deduction as the basic ways of presentation logic on the, this just an illustration. This is different with Fitch, uh, uh, very influential, a uh, very influential textbook, uh, because this is uh, the whole presentation of logic is via natural deduction system. and. Uh, it is so popular that very often uh, which uh, natural deduction systems in the uh, style of Jaszkowski are simply called Fitch style. Yes, uh, this is the popular name in the world. And Quine uh, uh, also has mentioned that the first textbook uh, with natural deduction is Cooley, a primer of logic from 42. But Quine is wrong. I have read this textbook. There is no <laughs> There is no natural deduction in it. This is axiomatic presentation, and then uh, Cooley uh, is introducing a lot of inference rules uh, just to simplify presentation of of, uh, uh, of proofs. Uh, uh, even uh, even there are in, in, in fact no uh, proofs based on uh, assumption. It it was just mentioned in the very end of the, this book. And also the kind of, for instance, rules for existential quantifier, which are totally wrong. Yes. Uh, so so uh, it is. It is. Uh, I, I, I must say that uh, that Quine was wrong with that, like with many things. I, I, I believe. And uh, he was also mentioning some uh, notes uh, of Rosser of, of himself. I had no access to this uh, to this uh, note, so I don't know what to say. Uh, anyway, uh, in the 50s there was a big textbook of Rosser on mathematical logic. There are no traces of natural production at all. So <clears throat> that's all what I can uh, I can say that Jaszkowski was certainly the first. And uh, uh, but what is the natural deduction of of Jaszkowski? Mm -hmm. uh, in this uh, paper from 34, there is a, an exposition of positive propositional logic, intuitionistic proposition, a slightly weaker version of Komogorov, no, no, no fighting, uh, classical propositional logic, then classical propositional logic with quantifiers. So, in fact, the kind of uh, uh, second order uh, logic. Uh, uh, restricted to, to, to unary predicates, in fact, and uh, inclusive, as I said, first of the logic. Yeah, the, these are the systems uh, he's presenting. And uh, 
when we compare the, the, the paper of uh, Jaszkowski and Jensen, both were thinking about uh, systems which are supposed to represent these traditional forms of reason. Yeah. But uh, Jensen was more interested in theoretical methods, uh, where uh, Jaszkowski was strictly uh, involved in uh, showing, oh, this is practically working system. Yes, and this, for instance, uh, both are using these formula systems. Rules are defined of formulas. Uh, also, rules as far in the uh, Jaszkowski is using negation and implication only, and the, the, there is only a comment concerning, for instance, uh, conjunction. So it, it shows that in this uh, restricted to this uh, these constants, we have uh, in fact the same rules. Yeah, but uh, part of different logic. Because uh, in the first order uh, logic, this inclusive logic in Jaszkowski and classical uh, in Gensen. And the, the most important uh, difference is uh, different formats. Uh, Gensen, interested in theoretical investigation, is using trees, which are for theoretical applications very, very, very useful. As uh, the, 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 the very uh, good presentation of the ready. But it is totally uh, inconvenient when you are uh, just want to use the, the, the system for constructing, for looking for it. Yeah. This, uh, this, is rather, this is rather for a uh, linear uh, system. It's better for linear system. And uh, with this dynamical concept, I, I will skip that. It's not important here. Um, instead, I should say maybe uh, about uh, that, that uh, uh, Jaszko uh, Jaszkowski, this is very interesting thing, Jaszkowski and uh, Jensen uh, has met in late 30s in Minster, Minster and uh, Jensen uh, admitted that yes, this is uh, quite practical and very nice solution uh, about Jaszkowski solution, but still he preferred uh, trees because he was interested in theoretical concepts and uh, theoretical analysis of what ah, this is a short presentation of rules i i i, I, I uh, with that uh, so maybe we will skip uh, skip this um, and some influence of gensen uh, mainly influence on uh, theoretical studies like Kravitz well-known study of na on natural deduction on all these works on the normalization of proofs. Uh, in practice, as I said, uh, trees are not very good. Uh, Jaszkowski uh, linear system better for practical applications, but of course needs some uh, technical toolkit to uh, to keep safe the proofs uh, to, to forbid using uh, assumptions which are already discharged. Yeah? And uh, he influenced many, many people. For instance, uh, textbook of Kalish Montagu and his uh, daily version of natural deduction, uh, Fitch, Poppy. Uh, again, Fitch is mentioned in Jaszkowski in uh, preface of his textbook. But nobody else, the people are using Fitch style, Fitch style, and Fitch style uh, natural deduction. Nobody is looking at the preface when uh, Jaszkowski is explicitly mentioned. And uh, also, the technique of prefix introduced by Jaszkowski was uh, then used, uh, simplified in Supersky and Borkowski, well known in Poland natural deduction system, but also used for other uh, applications by fitting, by Gabay. Uh, examples of proofs. First uh, system uh, of Jaszkowski used boxes to, to uh, divide, uh, to, to, to separate subderivations. In the second, there was uh, using of these prefixes. Yes, we have no time for uh, going into the details. And uh, this dynamic uh, presentation of the system, he was developing like uh, Leśniewski said that it is still under construction. So it was uh, that every uh, every line was in a sense a thesis, but related prefixes show to which uh, assumption in the domains are a kind of axioms uh, on which depend the, the, the line. Uh, on this uh, fragment, you have 
and uh, line six and line 17, you have absolute tests. Yes, independent, they are uh, null prefix, they are independent of any assumption. And logical constants of this textbook, classical propositional logic, again, with quantifiers as well, and classical first order logic and theory of identity and second order um, logic. And as I said, there are some other not uh, very important differences. The rules, and again, this was a quite uh, interesting solution of the problem of uh, rules for, uh, for uh, uh, existential quantifier. It is well known thing that for many authors of the, the natural deduction system, it was problematic. Uh, for instance, the copy uh, provided uh, uh, good, correct rules for that only in the fifth edition of his textbook. All previous ones had some uh, errors, yes, and then there was uh, improved and improved. It is okay, these are not too bad free the rules, but it works. It is for a propositional logic, but it is uh, similar ones for pairs of the logic. And the form of presentation. Uh, Jaszkowski is in this textbook is using uh, in, uh, to, to, to separate uh, subproofs, he is using this uh, horizontal brackets. Yeah. So the, mm, another example, another one, yes. The justification of the correctness of these uh, uh, rules for existential quantifier, because we can prove uh, this uh, definite. Uh, defining implication in both sides. And the last thing, uh, I was mentioning Tarski and Leśniewski, uh, at least in uh, two uh, articles, uh, two, two, two papers uh, devoted to uh, some problems connected with uh, group theory, he's presenting genuine natural deduction systems. And just for example, uh, here you have, it is uh, not original yes, because there are some proofs from uh, group theory, but let's say uh, how it, 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 it would la uh, looks like uh, in case of first order uh, logic. Here we have some simple example, and in order to prove an uh, implication, uh, first we are uh, uh, taking uh, the uh, universal quantifier, everything is in the scope of that, then the assumption, with signaling that uh, by this uh, implication that uh, everything then is, is going on to, to, to obtain what is in the uh, succedent. Then we are using this premise, again, first stating the, uh, stating the existential quantifier and everything is, that is in the scope of this, uh, which means that we should close this uh, and, uh, and uh, the ident uh, identification uh, is uh, applied for, for this. When X is not, we can get back again at the uh, outer uh, level. Yes, of proof. And that's, that's all. Thank you. And sorry for. Uh, in contrast to what you say, I was not strict on time. Yeah, but it, it, it was because of technical problems. So thank you, thank you very much for your talk. And I think we have um, time for two short questions. We have someone. Um, Small questions inside your interesting lecture. The first question reportedly, it was Lukasiewicz who appointed Leśniewski to invent the natural deduction systems during a seminar. Leśniewski was still a student of Leśniewski's. Can you confirm this part? Yes. I don't know exactly how it was, but these papers of Leśniewski uh, are from 29. Yes. So this is. Uh, knowing that uh, first presentation of uh, natural deduction by Ashkowski was in 26, it is earlier. So possibly he influenced Leśniewski. But maybe it was just the opposite. It's 
So it's difficult to find out what was uh, uh, what was first, the egg or the. <laughs> the other question concerns uh, the ongoing debate of axioms versus rules. It is possible to think of axioms as uh, rules allowing to introduce a sentence to a condition. Yes, yes, and, it, and uh, very often it is just uh, uh, stated like this that there are uh, the rules with. Uh, no empty set of premises. Yes, it's a, but it's a, a technical uh, technical trick simply yes, because uh, what we have indeed are axioms. Yes. Great. Thank you once again. Okay. And now we'll have our first five minutes online. Uh, it, is, uh, it will be a paper of uh, Professor Kultura Świętorzecka uh, from uh, Cardinal Stefan Wyszyński University in Warsaw. Well, usually Kultura is present here in Warsaw, but today she is far away. <laughs> Perhaps she will explain why she is delivering her lecture online and why she is not able to be here with us uh, today. Uh, so, uh, Cordula, please, uh, the stage is yours, you, uh, and the title of your lecture is From the Philosophical Method of the Warsaw School, Formalization of Inaction, the Proof of Sincer uh, on the Basis of Set Theory with Mirror Watch. Uh, thank you very much. Hello. <laughs> thank and you. Cordula, I, 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 I would like to say that I am sorry that I forgot that you were, you were about to take something uh, on behalf of uh, your university at the beginning, but I totally forgot. So I'm really sorry. But now you, know, you can, you oh, can no, no, take no, uh, no. a bit of our break and uh, say, <laughs> say something. It's okay. <laughs> uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. It's okay. Uh, uh, can you see my slides? Yes. So, uh, should I start? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, then I will start with a small joke, uh, which maybe refers, Anya, to this situation which you mentioned before. There was, uh, I don't remember the name of this pianist who uh, was in one studio and he was asked by journalists how uh, is his uh, ability to, to, to play piano and what about his uh, preference concerning composers and what about his feelings and what he thinks when he plays and how it is. And he was saying mainly, yes, no, I don't know. And then finally he said, okay, maybe I will play then. <laughs> so maybe I will play. <laughs> I mean, uh, um, this meta-theoretical, of course, uh, reflection is uh, uh, very important and without this we don't know really what we do. But from the other side, I think that also uh, it's fruitful to make formalization in action, to make philosophy in action. And this I wanted to show you what I did, well, how, what I played with. Uh, of course, referring to the philosophical methods uh, present in Elvov Warsaw School. And this is the point of my presentation today. I am sorry that I am not in place, just I am in, now in Madrid, in a small room. <laughs> and uh, so, but, uh, but uh, concerning my mind, I am, uh, I am in Warsaw, of course. Uh, so I will start with uh, three very important remarks uh, known for everybody who knows a little bit methodology of both Warsaw School, that there are considered three main methods or maybe groups of methods which are applicated by members of Revolt Warsaw School. So the first is conceptual analysis, the second is paraphrase, and the third is axiomatization. In fact, when you see this philosophy in action, like it was done, for example, by Jan Lukasiewicz or other people who, who uh, practice philosophy in this, uh, let's say, more formal style, all these three components are present during their work. And I will try to follow this practice and I will show you something which I have done uh, making these three things together. I mean, conceptual analysis, paraphrase, and then axiomatization. These uh, methods are beautiful, uh, uh, pictured and elaborated by uh, 
this known book from 2020, written by Anya Brożek, uh, by Mr. Pankowski, Mrs. Chybinska, Mr. Ivanik, and Tchaikovsky, Mr. of course. And uh, so uh, I would like to refer also to this book. However, my main interest will be this last uh, etap in, uh, in doing philosophy in this style, which I prefer to do. I mean, this axiomatization of some theory. In fact, this uh, idea comes from Lukasiewicz, as everybody knows, who had this idea, which Anya called program of logicization of philosophy. Yes, it was log logic logicism applicated to philosophy. And in fact, this is my preferable style of making philosophical issues. Uh, today, my issue is to formalize, but before to show you some fragment of conceptual analysis and paraphrase of a text uh, which was written by Avicenna. And this text contained the proof of censure. So it, 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 is, it is proof also known as proof of, uh, for contingency or, uh, or contingency argument. And so I am interested in this proof, let's say already for half of a year, uh, six months ago, no, four months ago, I was invited by Martin Krepczynski. Hello, I see you are here. <laughs> and it was my first attempt to formalize uh, this, uh, uh, this proof. Uh, uh, this motivation came from a Bolzano argument, which came to be very, let's say, similar to uh, Avicenna approach. Then I started to work by myself. And finally, now it will come the third, let's say, unit, because we decided to cooperate with, with three people to make some bigger part of theory, let's say, uh, theory in frame of which this uh, argument can be uh, reconstructed more, let's say, precisely or more fully. However, today we have the second attempt. This still is, is my, my small attempt. Uh, but today, of course, I am at the concentrated on Avicenna approach, and I will not refer today directly to Bolzano. Uh, motivation is, of course, historical and also systematic. The story is that this proof of Avicenna really was, a, a, let's say, a argument which influenced many other arguments for the existence of God. Let us uh, mention at least this proof for Saint, of St. Thomas uh, contingency. Also, there are some elements in Anselm proof in many ontological arguments like Descartes or Leibniz attempts. Finally, also one can find some similarities with Bolzano, which I just mentioned. And then it's interesting, even one could refer this uh, ideas of Avicenna even in this Gödel's ontological proof. So uh, history is uh, rich, and uh, uh, so this argument from this point of view is very, very important. Uh, Avicenna had his uh, idea to formalize, to, so sorry, to form his uh, argument in at least in four, uh, four works, all are written in Arabic, <laughs> and this was my limitation. But finally, I lose these limitations because now we are cooperate with Muhammad Saleh Zarpur, who is a Arabic speaking philosopher from Manchester. And he also wrote a very interesting book about Avicenna. And now we are pro in process of uh, translating this original text with his authority and with his, let's say, knowing Arabic language. However, today I will refer to the very known translation given by Marmura. Uh, from 1986 or 87, we will see. Uh, the uh, original text is here. <laughs> so this is a little bit of a problematic situation. However, we have this help, really a good translation of Marmura. And now we will have even better, I believe, by uh, Zarek. Uh, tools and motivations which I had of course, it was this Bolzano argument, which I just mentioned before. And even in 2014, I had uh, some work, I mean, paper, where I formalized just this argument by Bolzano. And at that time, 
I use the same um, formal tools as now I will use. This tool is uh, the unitary theory of individuals and set, which is originally formulated by Andrzej Ketubszczak uh, from, uh, from Toro. So uh, I had these three, let's say, motivations, my own paper, uh, book of, of Zaleg, and also this attempt of Andrzej Pietruszczak, which is, of course, the formal basis. And now we are three in this uh, new project, so we will make really maybe a nice, impressive theory. However, let's go simply to the text. I am sorry, now we will a little bit uh, stop here because in fact, to, to see my philosophy in action or formalization in, in action, we at least need to know the text. As you see, as you have seen, it is not long text, so please allow me to read it. These numbers which you see here, 1a or 2a or 1b, these numbers are invented by me because it will be helpful for making formalization. So uh, Avicenna says the following. There is no doubt that there is existence. Every existence is either necessary or possible. If necessary, then it would be true that necessary exists which is the thing being sought after. If possible, we will make it evident that the existence of the possible terminates with necessary existence. Point two, as before showing, the latter will, will set down premises of one of which is that for each thing that is itself is possible, there cannot be at any one time an infinity of causes that are themselves possible. This is because all of these causes would either coexist or not coexist. Let us, however, postpone this discussion for the latter alternative word. The infinite does not coexist in one time, each of its components existing before the other. Uh, I am sorry to interrupt. The uh, important thing is that this problematic, always problematic premise about impossibility of going at infinity. Here, interestingly, does not play any role like in Bolzano attempt. So especially because of it, it is really attractive. I mean, from the philosophical point of view. Let's go further. For the infinite to coexist, however, without including the uh, necessary existence such an um, aggregate in as much as it is the aggregate, regardless of whether it is finite or infinite, I'm sorry, must then in itself be necessary or possible in existence. Again, I will interrupt for a moment. The main structure is that we take the set of all, uh, let's say, causes which are not necessary, and then we form, he forms out of it, some kind of totem, some aggregate. So in fact, my hypothesis is that he used two notions of plurality, one distributive and one collective. And even I would say, referring to Martin's uh, uh, lecture before, he did it not only in practice, but he was very conscious about this difference. I mean, he perfectly knew that it is another thing to speak about distributive sets and another thing to speak about collectives. So I proceed uh, further. In point three, if the aggregate, let's say aggregate is a problem, is necessary in itself, then each of its components is possible in itself. Then the necessary existence would subsist in things that are possible in themselves, which is self-contradictory. If on the other hand, the aggregate is possible in itself, then it requires for its existence, that which bestows existence, this bestower, of existence would then be either extra to the aggregate or included in it. And now, of course, he will go to reject this assumption that it can be included in this aggregate. From here, he will have the conclusion that it must be outside. And so because it is outside, it must be necessary because all contingent causes are already inside of this aggregate. So I will skip this part because just I said what I just know what is written here in this text. And let's go simply to the 7.7, seven, uh, uh, 7. 7, which is really at the end of the proof. It remains that, that the best tower of existence is external, externus, 
the aggregate, but it cannot be a cause that it is contingent, for we have brought together every cause that is contingent within the aggregate. Hence, and here I marked this main conclusion, the best hour of existence is externus to the aggregate and in itself necessary in existence. I am sorry for so quick uh, uh, reading and for skipping these parts, but maybe later it will become more clear what is going on in this text. Let's say uh, when we start with this conceptual analysis and also with the paraphrase, we have to decide which main concepts are included or are involved in these argumentations. There is no, uh, let's say, doubt that there are these three existence, cause and plurality. Uh, what he says about existence, we will come in a moment to this point, but however, Avicenna considers three modes of existence, actual, possible, and necessary. How they play together, we will see in the next, next slide. Then Avicenna, he was totally aware say, and, and conscious about the Aristotelian uh, theory of four causes to say, more precisely, Avicenna was really a deep commentator of, Avicenna, of uh, Aristotelian text, however, in Arabic translation. And so people say that he was, let's say, neo-Platonic uh, follower of Aristotle. He perfectly knew this uh, theory of causes. However, he had some specific details which were different from, from theory of Aristotle. And in case of our argument, he considered efficient causality. Then, what I said already before, he had in this proof involved two types of, modal of pluralities, or uh, let's say yes, pluralities. Uh, here I am uh, following uh, uh, Zalek translations. He used in, in, uh, in Arabic kul or kul bahit. Kul, it is the aggregate, and kul bahit, it is instead of each one, it is distributive set. And then the second two uh, pair, it is collection in predication and collection in existence. Collection in existence uh, surely is considered as a collective, uh, a collective set, and co a collection in predication is considered as a, a distributive set. So when you read text around, let's say, this, uh, 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 this argument, what you can extract from the text, and you can make some paraphrase now, uh, you can say that every actually existent object is either necessary through itself or necessary through another. He uh, uses uh, two notions, necessary through itself and necessary through another. This is very similar distinction as Aristotle had between absolute and hypothetical necessity. Every necessary existence through itself actually exists. Of course, what we are looking for, we are looking for the object which is necessary existent through itself and not necessary existent through another because this kind of necessity is hypothetical. Then every necessary existence through another is possible and actually exists. Some possible existence do not actually exist. So great, we have something about uh, against a uh, uh, principle of plenitude, which uh, was called like that by, by Arthur Lovejoy. And every, uh, every possible existence which is actually existing is necessary through another. Now let's go to the second notion, cause. What about cause in context of this, art, uh, of, of this argument? What we know from text of, of Avicenna is that every possible existence which, which actually exists requires the actually existent efficient cause of it. No two objects can be efficient causes of each other. I mean, it means that relation of causality is simply asymmetric. The first statement is very important because it is essential step in our argumentation. It is, we would say, a causal principle. Then you have also the statement about transitivity of causal relation, also irreflexivity and acyclicity. 
uh, again, important in our argumentation is irreflexivity. Nothing can be an efficient cause of itself. Of course, acyclicity comes from asymmetry and transitivity. But this is not important here for our, our formulation. Uh, may I go further? Okay. What about pluralities? Uh, there are several moments in which we see that he was aware about this difference. Maybe I will skip this long <laughs> citations which I prepared here. Maybe only I will refer to a very known discussion uh, between Avicenna and people who were followers of this so-called Kalam arguments. Kalam arguments were this Arabic arguments which tried to show that the word must have beginning. There were several such arguments. Avicenna was against this standpoint. He wanted to keep the idea of Aristotle. He wanted to keep the idea that word does not have the beginning. And just when he uh, discussed these problems and when he formulated his counter-argumentations about uh, concerning this Kalam arguments, he exactly said this what I maybe would like to, to read. They show there, I mean, these people who uh, accept this Kalam argumentations, they show their ignorance of the precise difference between each one and whole. For when each one of the things has a certain description, the whole need not have the description, nor must it have it at some determinate whole. The aggregate, he says, and the whole are one and the same, though the whole in the sense of each one, he means, do, does not, sorry, render the aggregate necessary. This is in translation of Marmura and the first one also is in translation of, of Marmura. More principles will, will be used in this argumentation. Not all are explicitly written by Avicenna. Some of them are reconstructed. So, but I will tell you uh, exactly which we can meet in which place of the text. So, the fir I mean, first was causality principle, which we need. The second is uh, 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 the principle of irreflexivity, uh, a causal relation. Now we have uh, we have a, a, a principle which I uh, called a com, <laughs> uh, and it states that meteorological sum of any non-empty set whose elements actually exist also actually exists. I mean, if you will take any distributive set of actually existing objects, and when you will glue it in one, then this effect also is actually existing thing. Every efficient cause of any meteorological sum formed out of the set of contingent objects is the efficient cause of all its part. It is transferred, let's say, because the transfer principle, I, I called it like that, because it take, tells the following. If you have a collective set of some objects and these objects all are contingent and also this whole is contingent and when you will find an object which is a cause of this whole this object also is a cause of every of its parts then we have separation uh, uh, principle and i would say it is weak separation Every efficient cause, which is not a part of its result, is exterior to, to it. And so when we made conceptual analysis, when we made paraphrases, now we can come to the main point of, our, of Lukasiewicz, uh, 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 let's say, style of making philosophy. I mean, now we can prepare axiomatization. I mean, we can prepare a theory uh, in which we will take as an axiom these principles which were mentioned before in the natural language, and we can check if uh, there is this logical inference, if really we can somehow uh, make our uh, reasoning in a proper way, I mean, in a deductive style to reach 
the main conclusion about the existence of necessary existent object. For this aim, we use, as I told you, uh, uh, theory of uh, Andre Pietruszczak, which is called unitary theory of individuals and sets. In fact, we don't uh, need such a big theory. We need only some small part of it. But let's take at first this big, let's say, Mercedes uh, machinery, and then we will see what is really needed. So we take Zermel of Bank set theory language with Z for set and for being element. And uh, also we take part relation, this horseshoe. Uh, and so then we add specific expressions. Uh, a and A, P, A and R, all these are predicates. First three are one place predicate. The, the fourth one is two place predicate. So E, it is uh, 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 simply uh, can be read as is actually existent, uh, ex actual existent, I'm sorry. And A uh, is necessary existent through itself. P, E is possible, R is an efficient cause of, and then we have a uh, last uh, um, constant tau for the set of all contingent efficient causes. Interestingly, please remember that it can be that tau is an empty set. <laughs> yes, we will, we will come to this point later. Uh, okay, what about axioms? Axioms concerning this formal frame are rather, let's say, obvious. Maybe they are not obvious, but but, uh, but probably everybody will, knows what is inside. So we have all tautologies of the first order logic with identity. We have axioms uh, for for Z and and uh, um, being an element relation from Zermelo Frank uh, theory. Then we have uh, metallurgical axioms. The first about asymmetry, asymmetry of part relation, then we have transitivity, then we have definition of being ingredients, then we have definition of crossing, and then definition of separation. Finally, we have important notion of meteorological sun. But then we have also uh, the axiom which is about this meteorological sun that simply when you have some object, which is meteorological sum of some, let's say Z, which is a set. And the other one is the same. I mean, it is also meteorological sum of the same set. It means that they are the same. And then important axiom, or important, and this is maybe interesting one, maybe more than others, uh, that in, uh, in this theory, um, if uh, there is a uh, a set which is not empty, then you can make out of it meteorological sum. Take care that, of course, not all meteorological sum, sums must exist. Simply, you can do it in an intellectual way. And the last one is an axiom which states that distributive sets are from the perspective of our theory atoms. So. This is our formal frame, and now we come to axioms which probably was taken by, by Avicenna. At least if he would take it, then he would have quite nice theory, which would be like ours. So the first axiom is this existential premise that there is something which actually exists. The second premise, and that it says you how it is uh, the relation between necessary existence for itself and possibly existence and actually existence. So if something actually exists, then it must be possibly or necessary, and it cannot be both together. Then uh, there is a crucial definition of this totality tau. Tau is, this, as you see, distributive set. And inside of this set, there are all existence, actually existence, which are possible and which are causes of something. The next uh, uh, premise express our causality principle and states that if something is possible and actually exists, it requires something which actually exists and it is a cause of this 
fun which we are speaking about. Irreflexivity is the next axiom. Then there is a, a counterpart of our Epson principle, which I said before. Please look at it. Uh, this is important. <laughs> All of them are important. Principle which says that when you have uh, two objects, that one is the meteorological sum, the second one, that's the a meteorological sum of X, but in X, everything what is inside actually exists, then this Y exists. It's something different than this axiom for meteorological sums from this unitary theory of, of uh, individuals and sets. Then we have this transfer principle, which says you that when you have uh, uh, some set in which you have uh, objects which are actually existence and they are possible and you have some meteorological sum of it and you have some in some object which is a cause of this meteorological sum then this 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 object is a cause of all things which are in this parts of this meteorological sum and finally, here there is this weak separation that it means that if something is a, a, a cause of something other, then it must be inside or exterior to it. Of course, this part will be thrown out just with the help of irreflexivity. How proof is going? How is uh, proof is going really in a similar way as it is in the text? Let, uh, uh, let read uh, uh, this uh, proof in a very uh, uh, very simple, let's say, uh, uh, way, not um, only with the symbols. Yes. So the first, he uh, assumed that something actually exists. Then he assumes by logic that it is necessary or not. If it is necessary, then we are ready. If not necessary, then we take it this, we proceed with natural deduction, uh, which was a point of the previous, uh, previous uh, uh, lecture. So we take the second part of this disjunction and we know from this modality uh, uh, axiom that if it is like that, it means that there is this object exists and is possible. Then we use causality principle and say, okay, it must be then something which actually exists. It is a a, a, a cause of this X. Okay, but such an object can be necessary or not necessary. It is biologic. If necessary, we are finished. If not necessary, we proceed in the step inside. If not necessary, then, I'm sorry, there exists something which belongs to this our totem, because in our totem, just it is there are objects which are uh, actually existence and which are which are uh, po uh, uh, possible. So our totem, I'm sorry, is not empty. If it is, I mean this totality, I'm sorry, it is not empty. So there exists something which is a, a meteorological sum of it. And now we play with, maybe I will skip this, this moment, with this weak separation, we take our uh, our uh, uh, rules for uh, for taking uh, this notion of causality from holes to parts. Then we took if uh, flexibility, and finally I will go because probably we don't have much time. I will go to the end. However, however, as you see, I mean we have the final theorem. There exists something which is necessary existence. Of course, we are not, I mean, we are a little bit happy, but not very much. At first, we don't know if our theory is consistent, really. So the better thing is, the best thing is simply to find some models. We take few, I have here three different models. All of them, they show that our theory is consistent, but they show also something more. They show that this theory does not exclude some interpretations which are totally not in accordance or in the line of Avicenna philosophy. So let's take the first model. We uh, have the universe in which there are only two objects, T star and G star, which they are different. The object T star 
it is interpretation of our constant tau, as you remember, this was this set of all contingent actual uh, uh, causes of something. And now, uh, interpretation of actual existence, it is only G. Uh, interpretation of uh, a predicate for distributive set is only T. Then we will take a uh, possibly existence, it is empty. And simply, this is the model in which the first part of this first disjunction, which was put uh, 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 this, uh, uh, this first disjunction is fulfilled. So we have only two objects, as you see, and we have already God and all these the, the predicates here are empty. So somebody would say, no, it is crazy. Yes, it is crazy from the material point of view, but from the formal point of view, it is a signal that it is consistent. Of course, we don't want to have such a model. We want to put maybe more axioms to, to exclude such models. And to, and, but anyway, so long we have these axiomatizations, which we, uh, which we have, here are the next models. For example, here, this one is maybe the most, let's say, wanted. Uh, here we have four objects. Uh, all of them are, uh, uh, are different. Uh, there are only two objects which are actually existence. Uh, the possible is only R. Uh, Z, uh, I mean, sets are T star and empty set. And, uh, and this this R is an element of T. I mean, this individual is an element of this set of all contingent uh, actually existence uh, causes. And we will take part relation, uh, sorry, ca causal relation is that G is a cause of R. And now object T is the interpretation, as I told, of constant tau. And so we have in our interpretation the situation that G star is a god. <laughs> <laughs> and R, it is this small, possibly existent object of which God is cause. But this model is even, uh, this model, is, uh, again, it is a little bit strange. Here we have, again, four uh, objects. And however, maybe we will skip all these details, uh, but you can make such, such interpretation that all these objects, I mean, only T naught, but G, G star prime and S star, all are godlike beings. And moreover, as you will see here, uh, G is a meteorological, let's say, sum of two of its parts, G star prime and S prime. So as you see, there is some success that we see that this argument can be put in a deductive machine, quite precise, quite modern. But of course, from semantical point of view, we are far from our, let's say, success. We are just at the beginning. We have many problems which should be taken into account. For example, we should think about restriction, the necessary existence attribute to meteorological atoms. The second, we should restrict the necessary existent attribute to individuals. There are also, of course, many, many, many more problems. And I hope that these authors, Mohamed Saleh Sarpur and Tantri Kifruschak, will help me to, uh, to put out more and more unwanted models and to complete uh, at least a big part of Avicenna theory of God. To be continued in approach three, Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Świętorzewska, uh, for your talk. And I think we have time for some questions or comments. I wonder if you need or if you use uh, the principle that you can have a meteorological sum of any arbitrary beings. Uh, thank you uh, for this uh, uh, for, for this uh, question. I mean, here in our big machinery, we have this axiom, but in fact, you don't need it for this derivation. 
only you need uh, this ECOM, and this ECOM tells you that if you have any number of actually things, of actually existing things, then you can make out of it a meteorological sum, and this sum will actually exist. But you don't need, for example, such monsters in which you will have sets inside this yes, or sets of sets, because uh, this unitary uh, theory of individuals, uh, it allows you to make really very strange yes, meteorological sums of really very strange, I mean, strange collections. But this we don't need. So here we can cut it. Other questions for that someone from the line with you? Waiting for another question, perhaps I would like to ask you something, Kozuma. Yes, okay. of course. You mentioned at the beginning this Mukasiewicz um, program of uh, logicization of uh, philosophy, and Mukasiewicz uh, uh, stressed that uh, in the end of the process of axiomatization of a given theory, you have to check whether the results of your work uh, uh, are somehow in accordance with the data of intuition, uh, with experience, and with uh, the results of natural sciences. <laughs> and what do you think about the, um, uh, this axiomatization you make? Uh, are they in accordance uh, to this data or not? Uh, I, I would put it uh, uh, in the following way. Uh, it is not final project. I mean, it is it is not ended. And I think only in this perspective, you can think about these requirements which you formulated. Uh, I mean that just now we have this and now we are looking for maybe more intuitive, uh, 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 weaker or alternative uh, premises, which maybe would uh, be more acceptable. Uh, so, uh, here, I, I would say only this, that we are on the way. Uh, if you would ask me about my self-confidence of this, uh, uh, of, <laughs> concerning these axioms, I mean, I am confident that Avicenna was very consequent. This is the first. And he was not trivial. And maybe this also can be some measurement of the, of the valuation, especially of metaphysical theories, yes? Uh, but surely, I mean, I wouldn't expect that it would be somehow reference to empirical <laughs> in this very, let's say, primitive sense uh, 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 experience. Uh, it is metaphysics, uh, so. Okay. Nothing so, more to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in our plan of our session, not now we will have a break for lunch. But let us thank once again Cordula Sienkorzewska for such a And uh, we will meet after a break at uh, 3 p.m. So see you.
attention. That appendix includes a discussion of symbolic logic, an early presentation of logic, and according to uh, what scholars, it was influential in quality. It presents the algebraic approach to logic in Uterat's Algebra de Logique from 1905, but it presents it in a new manner, in the logicist manner of, of Russell and Frege. And it's a new, the first presentation of the new symbolic logic in Poland in this manner. Frege and Russell deduced principles of logic with a small number of axioms and rules of inference. Their goal was to prove the truths of mathematics, logic, and definitions alone. The algebraic school of Schroeder and Pierce used language as algebra, the language of algebra incorporated many laws of logic and equations. The use of logic was to solve logical problems of computation. That's the language that he used. Schroeder's Algebra of Logic had been published lectures on the algebra in 1890 through 1895. In the appendix, the Chavitz introduced Kudrat's logic and showed that the principle of non-contradiction can be proved in various ways. It is not needed as a axiom or fundamental law of thought that was relevant to the content of the book. Um, now, later logic in Warsaw was much was more influenced by algebraic logic than was the principia mathematica. That's my interest in this. I've been studying principia mathematica and puzzled at why uh, it was not uh, adopted as widely in Poland as I, I would like. <laughs> but my thesis uh, about the origin why there was this inclination for its algebraic logic can be seen by looking at a small detail in the appendix. So that's why I call this a perfection. It's about one particular theorem, Leibniz's Reclarum Theorem, brilliant uh, theorem. Russell proves this in his theory of implication. It was a paper that was published in 1905, before Principia Mathematica, the first presentation system style, there are some changes from Principia Mathematica, but it's a same style of presentation. It's proved this theorem, and I, I will read it because the dots are maybe unusual for people. If P then R, and if Q then S, and if E and Q, then R and S. Lukashevitz and Kutarat, and it's written this way, it's theorem 12. And that's what I'm going to be discussing. If A then B, and C then B, and if A and C, then B and B. This is the way they write it. It looks more algebraic, it's less than a symbol. Now, this theorem has two readings. One is a thesis of proposition of logic, and the other in the theory of classes. This is the theory of interpretation of these logics. A is included in B, and B is included in B, and the intersection of A and B is included in the intersection of B. I imagine this these lines because it had in the his method of combining concepts well, to have an algebra of logic in the combined so. so that's a fairly elementary theorem of propositional and logic, proposition logic. My talk is going to be about something puzzling that Lukashevich says in the appendix. And my talk will be to make sense of what he says and to it in quite sensible and to show why evidence of the influence of algebraic logic. 
this is a quote now from their appendix. It looked unusual to you because it in English. Remark to the proofs of T12 and T13. Here are the slides in the proofs in an abbreviated form. For example, the proof of T12 is as follows. A, C, then A, and A, then B, then in T, then B, and he goes through three steps. Now, Lukashevich says, in an extended form, it would look as follows. What we see is a proof that uh, has a few more steps, uh, and but it's written in an unusual form, the style of steps are not numbered. There's no justification for the steps on the right-hand side showing how each falls from an axiom or rule of inference from the steps before. There are these abbreviations or names of formulas, alpha and beta, A and B. They are not something you use formally to abbreviate. Are these theorems that are proved along the way? Anyway, it's, it, I don't find it very helpful what Lukashevitz goes on to say is that however the proof in this form, which no doubt closely corresponds with the above abbreviated form of the proof of T13, contains particular opens in argues in a simple And what he says he gives this way of abbreviating the formulas so that it looks like this. He pays the B, C the D, alpha and beta then this formula, that is he pays the B, C the D then A, C, then N, C, D. This reasoning contains an application of a theorem that is to be proved. This goes to show how careful one should be proving theorems, it can be improving theorems of symbolic logic. This struck me as an odd impression because that doesn't look uh, like a very careful proof to me. And in all my years studying proofs and incipient mathematics. So, what's going on? Does Kudrat really argue in a circle? Um, what is the proof in extended form? What does he mean? Does Kudrat even understand how a Frege Russell proof would be written? And that's his remark. So, how careful one should be. Of so I was baffled, and to, to get to the conclusion, that, no, I think Lukashevitz does know exactly what's going on. Kudrat is a bit careless, uh, but uh, both of them know what a proof looks like. Back, uh, back up for my, my proposal is text that I've been studying recently. Mother Greener went later on, on later to be the professor at MIT and invented cybernetic and very well known in the, in the middle of the, the 20th century. Wrote a thesis in 1913 as an 18 year old boy at Harvard University and went off to Cambridge to study with Russell. It's, uh, well known that Russell was a little bit put off by Wiener when he first arrived, and Wiener claims that his later discovery, Wiener, his discovery of the analysis of ordered pairs in terms of that's in the so-called Wiener Kuratowski style definitions, um, that Russell slowly maybe came to uh, Appreciate him. I think it was more thorough in studying this correspondence with Russell. And uh, what Wiener says, uh, starting off, was very critical of Russell, but later he became converted to his style of the ledger. He, would, he says, I should like to call attention to the difference between the aims of Schroeder and Russell, respectively, the distance methods which this entails. Russell's purpose in Principium in Germanica, as the name of the words, 
is to give an orderly development of the focal mathematics of any simple one. Accordingly, the theorems are arranged in the psychometric order, with the one purpose of arriving as swiftly as possible at the ordinary theorems about an algebra. Whenever a group of symbols constantly recurring, Russell promptly proceeds to abbreviate them in the simple symbol definition. As a result of the parents' great simplicity and obviousness given to many of his points, from the high which are very large and speedy. Then he says Schroeder, on the other hand, is interested in developing a department of mathematics which shall represent in symbolic fashion certain of the facts of the logic and shall discover new facts of the state of criminal nature. It is only of incidental concern to him what particular applications is with me of other fields. Therefore, he strikes out in many directions at once. And the various chapters of his work do not, in general, form a definite advance of preceding them. Rather, each one opens in some new field of work, which is often hardly more than in between. Since the main purpose of Schroeder's work is to show the manifoldness and the significance of the conclusions which follow from his postulates, he tries to retain his initial symbolism in all his formulas, wherever possible, and so it's little inclined to be as lavish as Russell in making new definition. This is Wiener's explanation of the use of algebraic symbolization in logic. And if you look at Lebechewitz's axioms and rules, some of them, you see that it looks like an algebra, a plus or or, less than for implication, juxtaposition for conjunction. And if I say they're all three for axiom three and five are most important. A and A and B than A, and if A and B than B, axiom four. Axiom five is B than A and B than B, it's B then A and B. Enjoy consequence of what you results from the same as and And two rules of inference, one of them, rule one, is just straightforwardly what is one. If one can derive A and derive if A then B, then one can derive B. Second one is a little unusual, and I've never seen this before. If you can derive delta and you can derive and derive Alpha and delta then beta, then you can derive if alpha then beta. So we have to do one antecedent time. Then we junction, conditional the conjunction. Perfectly valid. I don't understand actually where I it's used, but it is adopted by the particular. Here is what he gives as a proper proof of Leibniz's brilliant theorem. I won't, uh, I just want to impress on you that it looks unusual. <laughs> I had to work at this a long time and show you what, what's missing between this and what we can follow. It's before, no lines are numbered, there are 15 lines, and some of them have an annotation. Where does beta come from? If A then B, then if A then C, then B, and C then B. Well, it looks like it comes from putting together the first two of them. It doesn't say that. Um, the, the rules aren't tighted. It's unusual. It looks, and this was, this is my point, it looks like a person who doesn't quite understand what a logicist proof would look like, how it, how it works. It turns out that it does, but it is an unusual, just an unusual 
Exactly. Someone needs to be a mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. Here is a gapless proof. This is the phrase that comes from the phrase of, of a step, but for every step comes from either an axiom or a previous line by rules and principles. You see, the axiom three, A to B, and it's B to D, then A to B. Axiom B says if A then and C then A and A then A and B then B. And we axiom three says if A then C then A. By putting two and three together with a rule of two, remember that's the one for Notice points on one of the antecedents of the land contradiction and along antecedents. In this case, it, uh, two and three, we get to the conclusion. A that B. We, we can eliminate this antecedent. It's already proved it's instant action, and we can derive step to the Three, uh, step four, and two, three, and two. Then we take an enormous instance of an axiom. This is what people who work with axiomatic formalization have to get used to. It's the norm. As instances, and then you know, this one, and, you know, and so it proceeds. I have here the first 12 groups, there are 12 steps, it takes 21 steps. And if you look at it, you see that step 19 is really sort of the heart of it. If we can conjoin the antecedent, the A, the, if we can strengthen the antecedent, the A then B, and if C then B, then if A C then B, and if A and C then B, you can correct that the end is E, those two can be. And conjoin the, the consequence of A and C then B, and if A and C then D, and if A and C then B and D, then we can put them all together. If A then B, and if A then C then the action which tells us the syllogistic action or condition. And then second and second and third. That's the hard proof. We can join the antecedent, we, we strengthen the antecedents and then uh, join the consequence get them together. That's how the if you wanted to say the heart of the program. Again that the the it will have to go home and look this out. Now I take this gapless proof which is long and you can see how someone who's a mathematician wants to get to the heart of the proof find very long to go through 21 steps for something which can be changed by looking at step 19. Here's the gapless leaf abbreviated a little bit. Put in line numbers, we get a few lines. We combine by combining step one, four, axiom two, and rule two. Combine some different. Give names for things like A and Alpha and Beta. To abbreviate, to shorten, we don't have those enormously long conditionals anymore. We just have at step 19, if A and B, then are consequent. So that's what the Alpha, Beta, A and B, they're all lemmas. They're all things that are proved earlier on in this study. We don't repeat in full length. We combine some steps 
So it's basically the same proof, only now there are fewer steps. So many steps. Turns out it's exactly what the Peshiva said was the way to prove it. And I said there is a con here's the heart of the proof, the proof line on twenty one. We have used axiom three to show that the antecedents can be strengthened. That is if A and B and either B then both then A. But B and D both from the convention. And using the step of 18, which is B, we can join the consequence. This is the way we might have played first. So now for Lukashevitz's comments on on Kutarat's uh, proof. Kutarat just gives two, nine, and eighteen from the from the uh, Gapless proof. That is inadmissibly brief, I admit. He cuts out too much. You don't see how the proof is to go. Lukashevitz gives us extended proof 2, 13, 11, 17, 18, and 19. And I think it is possible to see the heart of the proof in that. Maybe not all of it. I don't see how you prove both A and B, and how you get those two immediately. But it's got the substance of the So, Lukashevitz, so, Udarat's loop is too short. Lukashevitz fills out what's missing, but still not everything. Okay, so that's the answer. Kudarat does know what a proof looks like. He knows how it's to go. He knows what the key axioms are. Maybe he doesn't. Lukashevitz clearly knows how to get that germ out of those axioms. And, mm -hmm. and so both of them understand what the logic is logic. But I think, I think what they show are both of them coming out of the algebraic and so are just shy of putting out that great, long, detailed, gapless proof. They argue like mathematicians to get to the heart of it as step 19 to explain how that's how they see a proof form. So here is my conclusion then, drawing to the conclusion. I pulled first from Gaskowski. Gaskowski, he says in 1926, Professor Lukashevitz called attention to the fact that mathematicians in their books do not appeal to the PT, make use of other methods of reasoning. The chief employed in their method is that of arbitrary supposition, of course, it's the famous conception of the notion of natural deduction. Their position of our assumption are you But I think there may have been other things that Ibushevitz pointed out where the logistic method is not the way mathematicians argue. They don't, mathematicians argue, they don't do it step by step. They combine several steps. It gets the heart of the They abbreviate things point to them on the board and say how to prove it. So, Dr. Karski says this about the study of propositional logic in the course of the years 1920 to 30, the investigation was carried out at Bosco, belonging to that part of metal mathematics or metal 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 logic, which has its field to study of the simplest deductions namely the sentential calculus. These in in investigations were initiated by the Lukashevitz, and the first results originated both with him and with Karsky. In the seminar for mathematical logic was conducted by the Lukashevitz and the University of Wilco, 
beginning of 2026. Most of the results indicated below in this famous paper are also stated below a blended amount of trends in the iceberg we found in the This is a statement that occurs to me that the approach to proposition of logic in Warsaw was initiated in the and my conclusion is that he did this because that was the way that he approached propositional logic. Interrupt is not on our UN circle, but does leave out two steps. What Lukashevich calls an approved and extended form is a slightly abbreviated Gregor Russell. Lukashevich's proof is rigorous, is a rigorous proof to combine with some steps together. Lukashevich is already aware that mathematicians in their groups do not appeal to the thinking of the theory of action. They don't proceed by stating one axiom after another. The use of the expressions alpha, beta, a seems close to the idea that mathematicians make proofs from the Close to this. If you look in Principia Mathematica, where there is a series of traditional and uses of modus codon, it's abbreviated by having the first conditional and then a series of consequences after the implications on indicate what follows follows from the antecedent. It's, it's only a step, and I think it's Moskowski or David, someone who said that the idea of net introduction of that way really so, my general conclusion is the orient origin of reference for algebraic logic for Russell's principle of mathematics and Warsaw can see be already seen in this appendix, the principle of contradiction is not. And, and it explains it and it Justifies this perfectly legitimate reaction to the mathematical advancement of the Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tom Solinski, for your talk. And now we've got about uh, 10 minutes for discussion. Are there any questions uh, or comments to the sector here in in Warsaw or there online? start, if I may. <laughs> uh, Bernard, tell me, uh, what do you think, what was the significance of this Lukasiewicz work on the principle of uh, contradiction published in 1910? For sure, it, um, it uh, initiated uh, the interest in mathematical logic in, in Lwów, uh, but um, was it also important uh, for, uh, for the, the studies in the history of logic? What do you think? What was the importance of, the, of this uh, uh, of this work, and especially this logical appendix? I think this appendix actually is to show that the notion of a fundamental law of logic is relative to a system. You can have some axiom from which something is a theorem. Others in which it is taken as an act indicates the assume somehow he thought that the act principle of non contradiction must be taken as an act. Okay, but it's not. So that that notion in this study of logic, there are some of I think some the open possibility. All of alternative maximizations of logic, 
And then, obviously, the short step from there to many valued logic and uh, the idea of alternative logic together. So I think that was a that was an important step in the study of logic, to break away from the idea of fundamental logic. Thank you, and I see that Professor Janowski would like to continue the discussion. Hello. First of all, hello, Bernard. And my comment is uh, uh, not to your paper, but to some historical facts. Uh, in, in the beginning of, of uh, the work on the foundations of mathematics, Leśniewski wrote such words. In the year 1911, still in my student years, I came across a book by Jan Łukasiewicz about the principle of contradiction in Aristotle. And now, this book, which is it, uh, in its time had a considerable influence upon the intellectual development of a number of Polish philosophers and philosophizing scholars of my generation became a revelation for me in many respects. And uh, so my melancholic remark is that, well, none of, of these uh, uh, philosophers, Polish philosophers and philosophizing scholars, including Kleśniewski, uh, didn't uh, notice this this, uh, so to speak, gaps in, in this uh, well, um, wor work uh, written by, by Łukasiewicz. And now I understand why, why uh, Łukasiewicz uh, said in, in a certain uh, work that Leśniewski was this was this man who was for him a teacher of precision but this precision was not uh, in uh, reading of, of Lukashevich's work but in constructing his own strange that you are the first person who, who noticed this uh, mankaments of, of the Yes, so I, uh, I think that this, this book influence, I certainly have guess me, is not just in, led by, by questions about principally mathematics and discovering the notion of precision of those <laughs> logic. And it was, was this work as well. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah, this work. It's still in a, in a formative stage. <laughs> and it was, you can see certain things as carrying the notion of its vision. As a re in response to this, this book, Right, thank you. Am, am I agreeing with you? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Are there any further comments or questions to Professor Linsky? So I, should, I, I, I can I can make one comment. There there are there will be a talk later by Adam Davis. He's going to talk about the project of translating Davis's entire work into English. And I hope that uh, my talk shows one consequence of project is interesting uh, those of us who cannot read all the German well enough to, to work with them in respect to you know, to, to, you know any of them. I invite you to pay attention to 
Got him. Thank you. Yes, thank you once again, uh, Bernard, for your talk and for the discussion. <laughs> and now it's time for the second uh, talk of our second session. Uh, let me introduce uh, two Marcins, <laughs> Marcin Trepczyński and Marcin Bentkowski, both from University of Warsaw. And they uh, will present a paper entitled Theory of Reasoning from the point of uh, from the uh, Warsaw. Okay. using from the process from medieval digital exercises. Yes, perhaps there is uh, some mistake in this title here, so I'm sorry because it's all, all my fault. So theory of reasoning through the prism of the Bobrosso School and uh, medieval biblical exegesis. Yes. Please give us a few seconds just to open the presentation. Okay, uh, we have a question to our online audience. Do you, can you see the presentation well? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, we are to start. <laughs> our topic is the theory of reasoning from the Lvov Wars to school of medieval biblical uh, exegesis. Uh, so, we will uh, show how useful the framework provided by the Lvov Warsaw School with respect to reasoning uh, can be to analyze the medieval biblical exegesis, especially in the 13th century and some decades uh, before. Uh, first, let's say that. <coughs> Okay. Uh, but here we should also skip. Oh. Um, uh, first, we should say that uh, our our results uh, are the results of the project we are carrying on, uh, funded by uh, National Science Center, and uh, this is our team <laughs> uh, working on uh, this project, which is reasoning in biblical exegesis from Stephen Langton. Thomas Aquinas, I, I will say something more about this project later, but first uh, I would like to uh, ask Martin to present our agenda for today and uh, present the first part of our presentation. Our talk. Thank you, Martin. So we have divided our talk into the three main parts. The first one is uh, the general picture sketch of the background that is theory of reason in the Wolf Warsaw School. We will characterize it, a, it as a pragmatic account, uh, defining reasoning as a process and as a product. We will also present uh, some details of the classification of reasoning by Czarzowski and Aydukiewicz. Uh, then in the second part, Martin will uh, tell a few words about the biblical exegesis in the 13th century. Uh, he will talk about our research material and analytical layer that can be found in these particular texts. texts. And uh, in the third part, Martin will present the, uh, the application of the Wolf Warsaw School framework, reasoning framework to biblical exegesis, uh, to identify particular kinds of reasoning, uh, to discuss some 
present and discuss some universal problems with textual representation of this meaning that can be found in biblical exegesis. And uh, he will also discuss how uh, this framework can offer a support for understanding such phenomena as special biblical inference, very special kind of argumentation or inference you will see. And of course, we will present some general conclusions that extrapolate from this particular material to the more universal uh, issues. So let's get started with uh, theory of reason in the Vogt Warsaw School. Uh, here you can see main works uh, devoted to this topic, uh, starting with Twardowski's Fundamental Concepts of Didactics and Logic. Uh, published in 1901. It was a um, textbook, textbook in logic. Uh, and then the topic was um, taken up by uh, the disciples of Twardowski, Kasiewicz, Katarwiński, and what is the most interesting for us today uh, by Czarzowski and Aitukiewicz. We'll focus on the uh, Czarzowski's paper, Classification of Reasonings, from 1952 with some additional remarks from Aitukiewicz proving and explaining. It was, was interesting that uh, one of the last papers by Aitukiewicz proving and explaining it was unfinished part of his textbook Pragmatic Logic is devoted to uh, these issues as well. So, uh, sorry, we have some issues with slide. slides. Uh, here you can see uh, two, definitions, two definitions of reason, one by Twardowski from uh, the, the textbook mentioned, and second one from Aydukiewicz, uh, from his textbook Zaris Logic, in the outline of logic. So Twardowski defines reasoning as a mental operation by means of which we assert that there is a relation of reason to consequence between two or more propositions, and, and of course it's called reason. Aydukiewicz, on the other hand, uh, defines reason uh, as follows. To reason means on the basis of some accepted sentences, proposition, to accept a new, not yet accepted sentence, propositions, uh, or on the basis of some accepted sentences to strengthen the certainty with which we accept other sentences. Accepted sentences on the basis of which we come to accept another sentence or to strengthen the degree of its certainty are called premises, and the sentence which we come to accept by inference is called a conclusion. So as you can see, they uh, adopt um, a pragmatic approach to uh, reasoning. Um, that is, they focus mostly on the process of reasoning, psychological process, but of course they also include um, uh, some logical aspects of uh, the process. Uh, and there is a tension between Twardowski and Aitkiewicz. You can see that Twardowski mentions in, uh, consequence and uh, reason, and Aitkiewicz is talking about premise, premises and conclusion. And of course, these are not the same, but we will try to, uh, to prove that. Of course, they, they are not the same phenomena. And probably the, the most major and intricate approach was given by Czerzowski, uh, as he states. It was based on traditional distinctions of the elements of reasoning. There are three of them. The distinction between reason and consequence, between premise and conclusion, so we can see it's not the same, of course. And something maybe less traditional, starting point and target. He does not recall any defin definitions of these categories, but they were defined, premise and conclusion, by Aitukiewicz, and of course, Reason and consequence are the statements, are the propositions connected by the logical operation relation of consequence. Okay. So we have uh, some definitions of uh, these notions, but uh, starting point and target can be quite obscure, and uh, in fact uh, it is. Uh, Czarzowski treats it as a task to be done, to define this concept, but in this paper, in this particular paper, he uh, focuses on um, uh, three main oppositions uh, deductive reductive reasoning, heuristic justifying, and progressive regressive. And uh, as you can see, he also mentions who was talking about uh, these types of reasoning in the past. So, for, for example, Aristotle, 
Zigbar with the car as the dragons and the protagonist. So we can assume that these are really traditional distinctions when it comes to the theory of reason. And Czerzowski uh, builds uh, a classification of reasoning. Here you can see a kind of summarization of his approach in the form of uh, the table. He distinguishes four types of reasoning, inference, proving, explanation, and testing. And it's common to the representatives of the both wars of school to talk about these four kinds of reasoning. Uh, but also you can see that we have different uh, concepts here, premise, conclusion, reason, consequence, and underlying element is starting point. So we have a kind of matrix that grasps the whole idea of these different types uh, of reasoning, but it's not everything that can be said. Czerzowski also defines these particular categories of deductive, productive, heuristic, and justifying progressive, regressive reasoning. And uh, he notices that inference is uh, the kind of reasoning that is deductive, heuristic, and progressive. Proving is deductive, justifying, and regressive. Explanation is reductive, heuristic, and regressive. And testing is reductive, justifying, and progressive. As, and if you think it's quite bizarre, we would agree. But still, please remember that Czerzowski mentioned that it is based on traditional categories. We still find it to be useful to uh, adopt this framework to textual phenomena, and we will, of course, show it later. But now let us discuss, discuss just one example uh, provided by Aitukiewicz in his textbook. Here you can see two sentences A and B, and a physical body which is generically lighter than water flows something. Ice is generically lighter than water. And the third statement, ice floats on the on water. And what's interesting that this is of course something we know. Yes, we mm, very often standardize arguments, put them in this standard form. But Aitukiewicz notices that the very same syllogism, as uh, he states it, can serve as a basis for both proving and explaining. So here we can decide if that is a, an example of argumentation of, or of explanation. Okay? And it's really important because some authors, for example, McKeon, uh, they, they say that there is no distinction between argument and explanation. And uh, I can offer some examples that uh, can, <coughs> can be used in, uh, in discussions, for example, with McKeon. And to show that the very same syllogism can serve as an argumentation, as an explanation, we should add additional markers. So it's not sufficient to point out what is premise, what is conclusion, what is reason, consequence. We need to put these markers together. So first of all, it's really important that uh, what we very often call premises and conclusion are in fact reasons and consequences. These are sentences connected by the relation of, of consequence and uh, it's point uh, made by Aitukiewicz. So we have two sentences expressing one reason uh, and in argumentation consequence is also a conclusion. Also, but it can be otherwise and it is in the case of explanation. And our starting point, according to Czeszowski's framework, is conclusion, of course, being a consequence. In the case of explanation, if we treat this, the very same syllogism as, a, as an example of explanation, uh, the starting point is different because the starting point is consequence, that is, the sentence ice flows on water, but this time uh, it's the premise, a premise of our reasoning, and conclusion is also uh, a reason. And maybe it would be more instructive to pre present it in this form. So when we think about starting point, we can use um, what Aitkiewicz proposed, that is question leading our reasoning. And it's 
really good to think about the starting point as a question which leads our reasoning. For example, in the case of proving we, the starting point, point is conclusion, but why? Because we start with question, is C true? In the case of explanation, we also start with conclusion, but we ask why C, why conclusion? Then we have two premises, then we have conclusion, but please notice that in the case of proving there is con uh, consequence as a conclusion, and in the case of explanation, uh, the reason is our conclusion. So we believe that's a very intuitive interpretation of starting point, but we don't know with margin, for example, if there is any intuitive interpretation of target, other than just, uh, say, the other part, the other element than uh, in the starting point, like complement to the starting point, so to speak. Of course, there is more to say about the classification of reason. There is whole tree representing different types. Uh, of, you can see the, the place held by proving, inference, testing, and explanation, but we won't stop uh, to discuss it today. We want to emphasize some points. Because uh, when we are dealing with texts, we encounter several challenges. One of them is that uh, reasoning indicators, so uh, words such as because, therefore, in texts they indicate the relation between premises and conclusion. And very often other parameters, for example, what is uh, reason and what is consequence, are underspecified. It's a very similar situation uh, to the one um, connected with speech acts, when we have direct and indirect speech acts. Uh, the other challenge is that various types of reasoning, for example, inference and testing, uh, gravitate, so to say, uh, to argumentation. Somebody can present inference in the text, but uh, we are inclined to interpret it as an argumentation that he or she tries to persuade us to something. Uh, of course, it's uh, due to converse, conversational uh, rules such as uh, Rice, Garcia, and Maxims, and, and so on. And the third observation is that contemporary approaches uh, very often uh, offer simpler terminological apparatus, terminological framework. For example, from the Anglo-Saxon tradition, very often explanation is treated as a kind of argumentation, argumentation or inference to the best explanation. And it's something very interesting, but uh, we believe that this particular framework offered by Czyżowski or other authors from the Bob Warsaw School uh, does, does not oversimplify the whole issue and is more adequate to empirically, so, so to say. Okay, so that's all from me, and now Marcin will present the second and the third thread. Right, thank you. Uh, so first, <coughs> something about uh, our protagonists, uh, namely five, five uh, philosophers, thinkers, uh, theologians from the 13th century, and in the case of Stephen Latin, maybe two decades before us as well. Uh, why? Why they? <laughs> I mean, I'm occupied with uh, <coughs> medieval studies uh, and medieval thinkers uh, for more than 10 years. Why? Because I like they are really analytical. <laughs> it happens that even more than 20th century analytical philosophers. Uh, but um, we observed that also their <coughs> commentaries, comment especially commentaries uh, to the Bible, are very analytical too. Uh, and they <clears throat> provide a lot of uh, reasoning, uh, a lot of interesting reconstructions of reasoning. Uh, and we thought that because we can observe uh, a kind of trend, a kind of turn in medieval studies uh, towards uh, biblical, the, uh, the, the material which, is, which are the, uh, the commentaries on the Bible, uh, Perhaps you heard about biblical Thomism as a uh, quite, quite famous trend now in Thomistic studies. Uh, we thought it would be something interesting both for uh, analytical philosophers and for um, medievalists. 
Uh, and the most analytical speakers we, we found are those. Uh, Stefan Langton, Robert Gosset Desta, Robert the Great, Bonaventure, and Thomas Aquinas. Uh, I guess that you know <coughs> almost all of them. Uh, Stefan Langton is a very important person with respect to the history of England, uh, but also a great thinker, you will see how careful and uh, logically advanced. Uh, and thanks to the project I was a member of, uh, uh, now his works, like uh, theological questions, are available and uh, are being published by Oxford University Press. So uh, now we can read it and use this material, finally. Uh, we, we have chosen, uh, as a sample, uh, commentaries on John, Luke, Romans, uh, Galatians, Genesis, Chronicles, Ecclesiastes, and Isaiah. Uh, some represented by three, some by four, two, some only by uh, one philosopher. Uh, but what is common to all of them? The something that we call the analytical approach. Uh, and we can enumerate a few elements, at least these five, uh, which together create, let's say, uh, what we call an analytical approach. Advanced reasoning, for sure, represented by all of them almost. Uh, logical analysis, reasoning reconstruction, because they find, in, uh, for example, in the Gospel, the reasoning is presented by Christ and try to show it, we will show the example. Uh, something like what we call metaphysical approach, and finally analytical methods for biblical exegesis, like divisio textus, so the division of the text. This is a technique uh, elaborated during the 13th century to first show what parts we can distinguish in the uh, commented text, uh, and also how can we divide these parts in next, next in the parts and parts and parts. Uh, not only to show that, okay, uh, we have some different different parts, but it is meaningful. I mean, uh, by this technique, they uh, start the movement of interpretation. Yeah, so uh, they are doing their job too. Okay, uh, a couple of examples. <coughs> of this analytical approach, please take a look at this uh, fragment. Uh, of course, we have these indicators mentioned before by, uh, by Martin, uh, but also some analysis of, of such indicators like as or because, cornea. Uh, in this particular um, situation, Stephen Langton shows that uh, when we read uh, the passage from the, from the Gospel of Luke, therefore, or I say this, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. Uh, he shows that the direction of reasoning is quite the opposite that we would think, uh, because it's a, another use of as on your not ostensive, but not uh, not causal, but uh, uh, ostensive. Yes, yeah, so we have kind of logical analysis, reconstruction, and uh, assessment, how it really works. Uh, now, only in Latin, but just to show you uh, how it, what tools he uses. Yeah? Uh, of course, it has been demonstrated, it has been demonstrated, and now proof. Yeah? Uh, and he gives, a, again, kind of analysis. This argument is not valid. The first premise is false, but something and something second. And this is the style he represents very, very often. Uh, now Bonaventure, let's see, uh, he's reading uh, the Gospel of John, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I am in them, and so on. So he tries to reconstruct Christ's uh, reasoning. He, Christ, gives this reason why his flesh and so on. We have, of course, therefore, he manifests so some indicators. But also, uh, he points out the uh, premises, the minor, the minor, the major. Yeah? So 
he reconstructs an analysis, uh, <coughs> this an analysis. Uh, and uh, something something very similar in Thomas Aquinas, also the commentary to John, mm -hmm. to a different passage. Uh, and he shows that what Jesus does, he disapproves something. Yeah. Uh, then the reconstruction of Jesus' uh, reasoning. And again, a string yeah, of, of, of reasoning with many, many, many uh, reasoning indicators. It was just an example. <clears throat> now let's see uh, how the theory of Walker's school on reasoning can be applied uh, to, to such reasonings. Uh, this will be the example from this time from Robert Gusipesta, who claims <clears throat> that it is possible to prove that God is in three persons. And the uh, starting premise is God is light. This is the extract here. Yeah? We extracted uh, the statements uh, from his uh, reasoning, but it is very close to what we find in the text. Uh, we used the manner used by uh, Bochensky <laughs> in his reconstructions of, of uh, Aquinas' proofs for God's existence. So it's more or less like this. Uh, of course, we use some <coughs> categories taken from Aristotle and his tradition, like uh, we, we can say that this uh, reasoning is knowledge creating and proper feed, right? But uh, mainly we use that framework from the book of School, and we can say that this is a kind of regressive um, reasoning, deductive, not inductive, and justifying. Of course, we examine all the steps, yeah, and, and the uh, <laughs> conclusion is that it is really deductive. We can, of course, discuss with the premises uh, if there is maybe some material uh, error, mistake, uh, and of course we, we have to remember that there might, might be some uh, hidden premises, but uh, in this case they are really obvious, so no problem. Anyway. <coughs> We use this framework, and it means that when we can combine it, uh, the type of reasoning is proving. We have deductive, uh, regressive, justifying reasoning. Of course, we also enumerate uh, some forms of reasoning used within uh, this deep reasoning and give some assessment. Uh, but what is more, most important, yeah, these concepts enable us to, to, to really deeply analyze it. Uh, but still, it is possible to identify the kind of reasoning, but still we have some problems, look. Uh, and again, the one course of school approach would be very useful. We can, we can <laughs> ask a question. Is it really, is it really uh, proving or something else? Because generally, the exegesis is a kind of explanation. It, it's in a way reductive because we have some uh, passage from the Bible and we have to explain it. Gross yeah? uh, test to start from the passage, Fatiamus hominem. God says, let's uh, create a human being. Yeah? Uh, but in Latin, it's Fatiamus, so the plural. So he asked, what does it mean that, why plural? Uh, the problem was that did God say, say to angels? He says, no. Uh, it, it was because he, he is in three persons. But he says, it can be proved. Uh, but here we can see, OK, uh, there is some passage and some explanation. So maybe it's redacted, maybe it's uh, explanation. But here. If we just see the, the statements and uh, how they are combined, we can say it's not proving, it's inference. Yeah? Because we have something, some, something follows from something, therefore there are three persons and not four in God. Yeah? So it's rather inference. But uh, if we remember Book Ayukevich, uh, yeah? he was talking about some leading questions. Uh, we can point out such a leading question. Are there persons in God? Three persons in, in, in God. So the whole uh, reasoning is, in fact, 
proving that this, this uh, sentence is really true. Yeah? So again, we, we see how this framework, how this approach can be useful. And now something special. Uh, we, we gave it a special label, special biblical inference. It's our own name. Uh, we don't know if it's an appropriate one, but uh, we have adopted such a one. Uh, this is something special that happens only in biblical exegesis for now, as you can see. Uh, here we have some normal reasoning uh, provided by Langton. Uh, it is like, okay, uh, when you are a king, it's good to have a honest, honest man with you, because then uh, he, he influences the king, and the king do good things, does good things. Yeah. But when such a, a person dies, uh, the king has a tendency to uh, do bad things. Uh, so. By this, it follows that it's very good for those in power to have an honest man, man by, by their side whose presence they respect. Because of the uh, respect for him, they will often refrain from doing evil. And suddenly, something special occurs. Hence, in the, in the in Ecclesiasticus, we have this and this and this. Uh, and it, it seems that, okay, it's, an, it's an, another conclusion. But in fact, it is very, very problematic. And it, it, it's a special scheme that uh, appears very, very often in those commentaries, in almost all the authors, that we have re reached some final statements and conclusion, but then we have some links to, the, to other passages in the Bible, and we really don't know what is this connection. Why? Because we can look. Uh, th this is the reconstruction of the reasoning, this is the basis, then, then we have this and justification because of this, but this is almost final uh, statement and conclusion, this is the general conclusion, but to this conclusion uh, we have this uh, passages from Ecclesiasticus linked by Hans Unter. And it seems that, at first glance, that the arrow goes there. We know this, so in the Bible we have this. But can we say that the Bible, the God who, uh, who have, has written uh, yeah, this, this book, was, was somehow um, pushed yeah, by the truth to write it? Uh, maybe it's quite the opposite. And we can be on another level of our knowledge. We read this in the Bible, and oh, and thanks to this knowledge, we have we know this. So we can imagine that the arrow goes uh, also the opposite. So the situation can be the following: maybe <coughs> we go from the statement, uh, which is a reason and an objective to, to the concept. But maybe, in fact, uh, we go from the consequence to the reason. If we say that the Bible is a kind of source of knowledge, and for that, that we read the Bible, uh, we gain some knowledge. And then we, in fact, go from consequence to reason. The next problem is that Unda generally uh, suggests that we go from the premise to conclusion. But we observed that it is possible to read on the, the opposite, in the opposite way, so the arrow would go there, to the left. Uh, so, like we have, those uh, is an artificial uh, example, just to have some, something short. Those as on the ego sum sum. We can read for that that those as we have uh, in Exodus that ego sum I am who I am, but. Maybe we can read those as on the that God exists from that that uh, we read that uh, I am who, who I am. It is difficult to grasp it, but uh, we are almost 
convinced that it is also possible to, to read it like this, uh, especially in theology. And when we juxtapose it with this framework presented by Marcin, we can see that we, we should consider at least these four possibilities. Yeah? That we go from reason to consequence and boom that goes there. Yeah? From consequence to reason and boom that goes there. But also uh, other possibilities when boom that goes to the left. And it gives us four options, inference, explanation, testing, proof. Of course, here we are a bit cautious, but uh, those options are still on the table. And perhaps, in fact, uh, within this special biblical exegesis, we should take into account everything. And this link between some statement, some general truth, and this uh, biblical passage uh, is a kind of vibe and mystical, maybe, uh, connection. Uh, another uh, example, just to show you that not only Unde uh, appears within the special biblical uh, inference, uh, we have Unde Digitus, so something similar, but also Sikutus Edit, as he himself says, as it is said, Sikutus Edit. And here we can all see even more, uh, like, we don't know what direction it is. Yeah. So the conclusion is, as far as biblical, uh, special biblical inference is concerned, that in fact we, we don't know how it is linked. Uh, but if we use the framework of Warsaw School, we can consider many, many uh, possibilities. And maybe this is the this is the hypothesis. Maybe this is the nature of uh, of, of the Bible connected with theology. Uh, and this is something common. Uh, I think theologian quite often says say that uh, when we when we read the Bible and when we do theology, in fact, we start from the Bible to create a doctrine. But then we get take this doctrine and go back to the Bible and. And it's a kind of circle, uh, and an entanglement. Yeah. So uh, even if we started from one point and reached another point, then we go from that point back to other statements and see it again, but in the different light, more detail, perhaps. Yeah. So this would be uh, the nature of, uh, of doing theology with the Bible. And that's it. Yeah. So, the time for conclusions. As you can see, this framework is quite powerful. It's useful in the study of reasoning in medieval <coughs> biblical exegesis. Uh, it helps in identification of reasoning. But also, it's a good tool which enables discussion about the back nature of some reasonings, like in the case of special biblical inference. Finally, uh, we have these problems with uh, with relations between texts and reasonings, and it's really ch challenging because one, uh, as Martin said, we have a lot of pragmatic contextual influences which are needed to be considered. In the lexicals, metaphors, speech of science, implicatures. Also, the theory of argumentation and its tools is better suited to dealing with proving a al almost nurse explanation, transposition to argument to the best explanation. Right? Uh, and here we go to this problem, uh, both versus school framework versus Anglo-Saxon uh, approach. Uh, in our opinion, the uh, both versus school framework offers interesting and more rich terminological conceptual apparatus. Uh, it is also rooted in strong logical tradition, so another advantage, both formal and informal. Uh, and both of them. Both approaches need further elaboration, especially when the relationship between text and reasoning is concerned. Both works of school framework can be valuable for linguistic studies, uh, for instance, critical discourse analysis. But we are convinced that it needs still development. Thank you very much for your attention.
fix, uh, fix for your talk and uh, we've got about uh, five minutes uh, for questions or discussions. Yes, Professor Andrzejczak. Uh, thank you for interesting talk. Uh, I have some comments. Because of this list of, of uh, proposals uh, of the classification of, of uh, reasoning in the so forth, so forth, I, I uh, think it, uh, it, it, it would be worth adding uh, Salamucha to this list because it uh, has also made, in fact, if, uh, this, uh, he improved, it, it improved in some, some way the Kotabinski and Dutasiewicz. Uh, Classification uh, by ch changing the the the, the, the uh, application of some notions. As I, I, I think it should be sort of added to the, this list. And, uh, the, and also, I have some comment, if I may, the second one, one, one shot. <laughs> uh, the, uh, it is uh, quite um, amazing that the, uh, such. Uh, important uh, distinction to, to, to Twardowski as bet between the um, process and the, the result was not consequently applied by these uh, thinkers to in, in, in their ideas how to how to make the uh, classification of um, it, it seems that many criteria or even labels for some some of them are rather uh, concerned with the process some of them are rather concerned with the results, mm -hmm. and, and it is mixed. It mm -hmm. is mixed. There's no no clear way how, yeah. how, to, how to make it this thing. It's, it's a stretch. Thank you so much. So, to the first point, absolutely yes. We would, uh, would like, I would like, like to uh, add also Bohensky. Yes, yes, yes. I, yes. I, I, I would like to thank Bohensky. you for this comment because always when we are discussing together, uh, I, I, I too much remember about Salmuka and Bokhaisky. I mean, I, I prefer their approach. But, and, but I, I think that, that Bokhaisky was not proposing some, something mm -hmm. different. No, no right. Right. Uh, yeah. only put it as yes, yeah. But Salmuka uh, yes. made some change. Yeah. 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 Yes. And, and he was maybe the first who, who proved uh, Leshnevsky's uh, uh, not perfect uh, classification. But to say that he was not. And uh, I absolutely agree with the second one. Uh, Jozowski behaves like he treats uh, the reasoning as a product. And he imitates some processual categories, some processual markers that can be applied to, to reasoning as a product. So for example, starting point and target are just markers, so to say, just to indicate which part is uh, concerned as a uh, starting point, but in fact it's uh, more understandable when we transpose it to the process, which was in the, the kind of uh, in like cage study, yes? So we question the next steps, yes. yeah, but uh, it's really interesting. I may just want, uh, add to one thing. Uh, I think the problem with this actions product is that the, the distinction is, is very fruitful, but it is not uh, <laughs> enough clear. <laughs> because uh, you know, if we are talking about uh, products of uh, uh, of uh, our uh, thinking, yeah. What, what is this object product of our thinking? Is it psychical? Is it uh, something outside our mm -hmm. mind? Is it uh, uh, that's uh, Is it uh, <laughs> yes? What is it? So I think that's, uh, that the problem with this interpretation comes from the problem, the problems with products. It, the distinction is, is marvelous, it's fantastic, but uh, it is still unclear. In a sense, the text is a result of our... Uh, yes, in a sense, in a sense text, of yeah. course, is also a result of our psychophysical uh, yeah. process, yes. Uh, yeah, Colin? Um, thank you for this. In the contemporary philosophy of argumentation, often people argue about what argument is supposed to do. You may know that there are the Dutch pragma dialecticians who think that argumentation is the attempt to resolve some dispute or to bring about agreement. I would be interested in your point of view on this uh, kind of program in philosophy of argumentation. And 
I'm skeptical about it, also because I think that rules of argumentation emerge from genres which generate the norms for those arguments. And in a lot of arg contexts of argumentation that I uh, observe, nobody wants to generate any kind of agreement. Mm -hmm. But if what you're studying is, of course, a highly specialized genre, which could have genre-specific norms which don't attach to any sort of larger normative framework of argumentation. So that seems like, you know, I mean, I, I'm not trying to put it dismissively, but this is definitely an argumentation subculture yes. that you're dealing with. And it would be important to identify. Yeah, you're pointing out the really interesting limitation of this framework because it's uh, thought to be a good account for dealing with discursive texts. Discursive meaning that the stake is the truth of our uh, beliefs, convictions, yes, propositions. And in fact, there is no um, dispute uh, to reconcile other parties or to achieve some kind, kind of consensus here. Yeah, the, the stake is the truth, and this type of text could be. Uh, could function without any audience, of course. Yeah. Could, but of course they are but managed not have to be exactly. Exa so I would say that it's natural limitation, but still Czerzowski's approach or other representatives of the Wolf Force was not it's open to such pragmatic interpretation, but it's, it was not meant to be at this uh, very stage of development. It's open, but they, they didn't concern uh, such aspects. Yes. OK, perhaps the last question from Professor Jadanski before the break. Well, about 25 years, uh, well, I have published uh, with my two colleagues, prof now Professor Tawasiewicz and Professor Sopniska, the uh, historical reconstruction of this this uh, the classification presenting in the Ofkosov school, including Twardowski, Lukasiewicz, Czyżowski, also Salamucha, uh, and, and others. And we propose to understand this opposition's uh, start, starting point and uh, target of reasoning um, in terms of sentence which is given and sentence which is uh, looked for or matched to and i think that uh, using this term all these problems of of, of uh, classification uh, 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 are quite clear so i i propose this reconstruction thank you very much professor Yadansky. it's really interesting because i uh, i'm very uh, curious how you deal with argumentation or proving the, them because the starting point is um, the consequence yes uh, and we are looking our target is a reason yes reason being premise in, in this particular case and I am really curious and I will read your uh, paper uh, would be a great pleasure and maybe I, I will contact you if you don't mind to elaborate on that more but thank you so much I, I, I got some questions but well it is it is uh, well uh, reprinted in my book methodology and semiotics which is in Polish and in English also. I'm pretty sure I have read it but I don't remember I can't recall the specifics now but thank you anyway okay. thank you Okay, thank you once again to our speakers. <laughs> now we've got uh, about 15 minutes break and we will be back about uh, 4.30.
Witaj Urszulo. Witaj, witaj Jacku. No jak się masz powiedz? No trudno, powiem ci po, po, po tej sesji. Mam problem. Tak? Ale z mówieniem? Rodzinie... Z mówieniem? Proszę? Z mówieniem? Z mówieniem mam problemy z, z głosem, bo miałam dużo przejść, wiesz, siostra mi zmarła. Nie o, tak. to przykre. No Ale tak... starsza czy młodsza? No troszkę młodsza, yy, starsza, troszkę no. starsza. Lekarka. O. Moja, cała opoka mojej rodziny. No to rzeczywiście. Moja siostra, chociaż jest 8 lat starsza ode mnie, to trzyma się lepiej niż ja, więc w tym sensie jest, mam opokę też w niej. Mam nadzieję na wiele lat. No, no czasami, będzie. czasami to jest tak ciężko, tak ciężko się pogodzić z tym, także. No. To jak prawda. Mi ciężka w ogóle, no, no w ogóle z mówieniem mam zwykle kłopoty. To Urszula, nie ja będę mówię, cię... Ten jest bardzo długi, bo to no, przegląd po wszystkich metodach dowodzenia, także ja nie wiem, no z głosem nie wiem, jak sobie poradzić. To nie będę ci teraz zawracał głowy, oszczędzaj głowę. No ale ja muszę wprowadzić slajdy, a nie wiem jak. A to ja tego nie wiem, to no szefową to zapytaj. Musi Ania przyjść chyba, że... No tak, na pewno tak. No to trzymaj się. No to trzymaj się też za mnie kciuki, proszę. Jasne.
since you might take your coffee and uh, cookies with you. And we are coming back to our sessions. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce our new uh, speaker. Uh, it is uh, Professor Urszula Wybraniec-Skardowska from Cardinal Stefan Wyszyński University. And the talk of uh, Professor uh, Wybraniec-Skardowska is entitled The Pioneering Proving Methods as Applied in the uh, Warsaw School of Logic, Their Historical and Contemporary Significance. Right. And then I can begin. I will begin from a short introduction on the situation of theorems in science. Then I will present two coding methods used in deductive science, the axiomatic method and the natural deduction method. Then I will outline the axiomatic method by means of rejection or reputation proposed by Rashidi, and also the method of generalized natural deduction, the, the hybrid deduction reputation method in formalization theory. <coughs> then I will briefly mention the most significant results which the application of this method brought in contemporary scientific research. The whole of Warsaw School was governed by postulate of clarity, of accuracy, and precision of thinking, as well as expression thoughts in language. It was connected with another uh, postulate accepted by the of Warsaw School, that is of convincing and appropriate classification of propositions and theorems. Justification of theorems play a vital role in any rational human activity. It is indispensable in science. The proposition which it meant to be part of theorems of a given discipline should be true and its truthfulness must be true. Thus, it must be justified. As far as natural sciences and humanity are concerned, the second point is direct justification of propositions based on external observation or introspection. Here, observable propositions are the foundation of which other theorems of this experience rely. Consequently, the latter are indirectly justified by means of reasoning. And this both substantiated inference, non deductive and deductive inference, in which the truthfulness of premises secures that of conclusion. Deductive sciences, deductive inference finds its application in all sciences and in deductive disciplines, which includes mathematics, the mathematical sciences and system of formal logic. It is used as the sole method of justifying theorems. Deductive sciences are that discipline in which deductive method of reasoning, deduction method, is used exclusively. Generally speaking, deductive science is a set of propositional expressions with which are derived from certain data, data asserted or assumed expression of this set by means of rules of uh, deductive interest. Expressions deducible from the given defined expression of the set are thus theorem of science. They have a proof. At the same time, the deduction method is, uh, of justifying theorems of such science is the proving method of its theorems, a method by means of proof. Proof method. Applying the deduction method obviously requires specialist logical competence and knowledge of two basic types of proof methods. 
axiomatic deduction method and natural deduction method, both of which were created and practiced in the <coughs> Warsaw School of Logic, the famous branch of uh, the Warsaw School by the creator of the school, Jan Krasiewicz, and his important representative, Stanislaw Jaszkow, to respect it. The two deduction methods applied in building a deductive sciences are simultaneous with the fundamental method of forming deduction systems and theory. I will regard first the thematic method and the next natural deduction method. The axiomatic method is the most often applied one in construing logical system and mathematical sciences as deductive discipline. It leads to building them as axiomatic deduction system. Axiomatization of such a system consists, as it is well known, in the, the, the set of its expression called axiom is proven. They are acknowledged as a primitive theorem of the system. They are not provable on the basis of other expression of the system. By means of them, as well as the initial primitive interest rule accepted in the system, the remaining theorem are proven. Contemporary understanding of science as a theory of high degree of exactness and precision requires repeated as a deduction system. Deductive disciplines have not always been built uh, as axiomatic systems. Depending on the degree of methodological precision, the following three, uh, three stages of construct, uh, constructing of deductive system as the system are distinguished. Pre-axiomatic, non-formalized axiomatic, formalized axiomatic. At the formalized axiomatic stage of deductive science, being the most exact process of building a deductive discipline as a system, the following are clearly made precise. The notion of a well-sentential expression of this system, set of its axiom, primitive inference rule, rules of introducing the definition. The notion of proof is precisely defined on the ground of a given formalized axiomatic system. We know the notion of proof. I uh, remind them, we call uh, this notion of, of uh, on the screen. A sentential expression of a given formalized axiomatic system is a theorem of the system when there exists a proof of the ground of the system. Formalized uh, axiomatic system are rooted in uh, the tradition derived from Gottlob Frege. However, as Jan Lukasiewicz proved in his monograph on Aristotle's logistics and prior to this in the monograph written in Polish before the war, which got burned during the war, so uh, uh, Aristotle's logistics was the first axiomatic non-formalized system in the history of the Europa Tau. The historic discoverer Dai Lukasiewicz was revolutionary and contributed to formalization of different systems of theologistic cultivated through senses as the main tool of logical deduction. Lukasiewicz construed the first formalized system of Aristotle's theologistic therefore a logical system satisfying contemporary requirements. The axioms uh, of uh, Aristotle's logistic are two, two logistic modes, Barbara and Deficit, and uh, two identity laws, FPS and and some as RS. Inference rule are the following, detachment rule, which says if alpha then beta, and alpha does beta. Substitution rule, alpha does substitution of alpha, and the definition of the replacement rule, alpha can be replaced by beta. 
who can see it in series with also construction of other axiomatic systems of periodicity which satisfy contemporary requirements. Today, various such systems are known. All of them are, are formalized uh, term calculi built over classical propositional calculus, which is the basic uh, logical system. Fukashipit gave also some simple axiom system of logical propositional calculus. It was formalized as the intricate negative axiomatic system. The primitive inference rule of this system are the detachment rule and the substitution rule. The system was included in a book elaborated by Moses Pleturga, brought out uh, under the title Elemental Mathematics, Elements of Mathematical Logic. In formalization of this and later also other propositional calculus, Lukashevich applied the work term of now parenthesis involved very economical along abodines of such equation as bracket and ordo. The manner was later called Polish notation. Lukashevich disciples, Sobocinski, Kupetsky, Weisberg, made a considerable contribution later to the development of standard automatization of non-classical propositional calculus. As it is well known, Kashevich was also one of the two besides American logician and first creators of non-classical logic, many values logic. First we evaluate propositional calculus and then its generalization covering uh, any kind of an infinite value propositional calculus. The calculi way construed by Kukashevich with the use of the semantic method, mathematic, stated, non axiomatic, but by Sobocinski and Sobocinski, uh, work on solving axiomatability problem of this logic. We own the axiomatization of Kukashevich's people like logic to Weisberg and Sobocinski. Sobocinski gave axiomatization for any kind of n value propositional calculus of distinguished k value. The discovery of many valued logic and their axiomatization belong to the most significant logical development in the 20th century. Historically, one of the most meaningful studies in the field of standard formalization of logical systems which were conducted by a representative of the source group, apart from Lukashevich and his disciples, were, were the, those of, uh, by Stanislav Leszczynski. Leszczynski created three axiomatic logical systems, prototypy, ontology, and mirrorology. Prototetic is a generalization of logical propositional calculus. Leszniewski's ontology is on the one hand generalization of classical chemical calculus and on the other one theorem calculus, calculus of names. While Merole logic is a system built over ontology in which the axiomatic properties of being part of the relation part whole are established as well as the concept of the set in collectivist uh, sense. Leszniewski, the creator himself, and uh, his uh, co worker Dark Piper, Sobocinski, Supetsky, Lejewski, were taking part in perfecting and detailing the formalization as well as simplifying the axioms of this system. Sobocinski simplified in particular Leszniewski axiomatic of ontology. He also gave the shortest axiom of prototypes. The main points of the formalization of the above mentioned systems, Leszniewski's work was criminal regarding the time in which they appeared. They were times when efforts were made to build a grand system covering the whole that is known. And it is attempted to bring mathematics to logic to set 
Leszczewski's logical system were by his invention some realization of this fact. The system exerted a great impact on not only logical and mathematical research carried out by representatives of the Russell School, but also on studies and views expressed by logicians, philosophers of the Russell School, especially those of the Danish who, according to Leszczewski's analytic preference, adapted some of the assumptions and concepts in his own philosophical work and view. The methodological studies in, into formalization of the very didactic systems that were conducted in the inner war uh, period are also of historical importance. They were taken by uh, Alfred Starsky, probably the best now representative of Russell School. And it is not only because uh, of his most famous, uh, famous work on radical notions. Also, Tarski published two works presented for the first time ever a theorization of the general theory of didactic system and the theory of didactic system based on classical notes. This theory are called consequent theory and their uh, actions are used in methodological studies. The formalized uh, <coughs> mathematical axiomatic system can be founded on logical system built um, by means not only the axiomatic method, but also with use the natural deduction and D method. The natural deduction method was the term for the logical system called system of natural deduction positional system. It was officially presented in the first time by uh, the outstanding representative of the uh, Warsaw School Statistics. The English version of method published by Spetsky coincided with the publication of uh, by German logician Gerhard Grenzer, the four Jaskier are regarded as two independent creators of on and the systems are built uh, as one in which the cubic method is based solely on didactic inference rules without uh, assuming axiom. The set of, of axioms uh, is thus a method of deduction from assumption only. The assumption here are parts of premises of the accepted inference rules. The indeed methods is close to natural practice of rhyming deduction of truth in the natural language, in the common discourse and science, and as a formal method of proving, it is close to natural the truth method applied by mathematicians in the practice. The anti method is a formal reconstruction, reconstruction of the traditional manner of reasoning. System built with the use of and these methods assume certain opening primitive inference rule, uh, rules that first. The intuitive uh, uh, rules considered as deductive one and can be built in a verified case. The in this system allow in particular admittance of various forms of proof, direct, indirect, ramified. The ND system includes, apart from the inference rule, special rules of construing the proof, thanks to which construction of a proof is intuitive and much easier than construing proof uh, with the use of axioms. The works by Ryashkovsky and Ganser were direct in the history of logic. Admittedly, as Lukasiewicz referred, it is already in antiquity that Stoics might classify theorem, uh, accepted five, uh, five open not to the uh, rules of argumentation, today known as the so called logic uh, rules of that. Yet, it was not until uh, Jaskowski that the better built 
the best early system with new ideas and methods were introduced into science and could be applied in building different reactive systems, mainly logical ones. The rejection method <coughs> complemented the didactic one discussed earlier, that is axiomatic and method. They were initiated by the works of Lukasiewicz and Peshkov. The released two different reduction methods, axiomatic and generalized natural reduction. They will be discussed in the next, uh, the next part of my presentation. The idea of rejection originated from Aristotle. The notion of rejected was introduced in phonology by Lukasiewicz who applied its complete, complete uh, characterization of the system using the axiomatic method of rejection of proposition. Lukasiewicz formulated it first for Aristotle's logistic and then applied it to some the propositional calculus. Intuitively, it differs from the axiomatic deduction method is there. That's why the common method applied to prove acceptable expression of group or participant system. The rejection method is applied to refute or re reject non acceptable expression, false one for the expression. Still, before uh, the war, Ukashevich, upon construing the axiomatic system of Aristotle's prophecy, were among other all through the logistic forms are true, explored the problem of systematic refutation of false the logistic forms. As Lukasiewicz pointed out in his article and the monograph regard before the war, and which he later produced after the war and had published in English, Aristotle, in his systematic investigation of the logistic forms, not only proved the true one, but also showed that all the other are false and must be rejected. Further on, Mukashiki observed, Aristotle rejects invalid forms by, uh, by exemplification to conclude them. This procedure is logically correct, but it introduces into the system terms and a proposition not to remain to you. There are other cases where he applies a more logical procedure, reducing one invalid form to another or rejected. On the basis of this remark, the rule of rejected, uh, rejection could be said corresponding to the rule of deduction by assertion. This can be regarded as a commencement of a new field of logical inquiry and of a new problem that has to be solved. In this situation, Lukasiewicz formulated the axiomatic method of rejection force as the logistic force. He axiomatically recruited to the logistic form and attached to this rejection, uh, rejection axiom the following two rejection rules. The rule of rejection by substitution, which says any expression alpha can be rejected if its substitution is uh, rejected. And the rule of rejected by judgment, which says if the implication if alpha then theta is asserted and its consequence is rejected, then in fact uh, its uh, antecedent uh, alpha can be rejected too. The rejection rules, in contrast to the assertive uh, rules of detachment and substitution, leading from true expression to true expression, run from false expression to false expression. Thus, by means of the axiomatic rejection method, it is proved that the all false forms of the axiomatic service belong to um, rejection. Uh, reject, uh, reject uh, expression. 
Lukashevich accepted it at the, at the same time that it caused a pressure of this logistic system processes approved by means of rejection, rejection proof. He accepts the uh, definition of rejection proof, uh, which I present on the screen. As we can see, Lukashevich by applying the new rejection uh, axiomatic method, besides the common uh, axiomatic method of proving theorem, formalized Aristotle's linguistic on two levels. On the first one, as the assertion system, and on the other one, as the rejection refutation system. Schematically, if the set of axioms of Aristotelian the logic is denoted by S A plus, the set of its inference rule by R plus, by the set of its rejection rule uh, axiom by A minus, and the set of its rejection rules accepted by Lukashevich by R minus L, then the assertion of the logistic system is formally characterized as the pair I plus R plus and its rejection reputation system as a part A minus R minus M. Those arose a problem, though, since the set of sentential expressions of the logistic, uh, Aristotle's logistic system is infinite, the question is as follows. Is each sentential expression of the system either a theorem or a rejected expression? The four more formal. If we denote by S the set of all sentential expression of the logistic and the set of all theorems of the assertion system by T plus, why the set of all rejection, uh, rejection expression of the reputation system by T minus L? Then the above asked the question can be formulated mm, by means of uh, these two conditions. Uh, are the following conditions are satisfied? The set of uh, theorems of the logistic and the set of all rejected uh, proposition of the logistic are disjoint, and the union of this uh, set is equal to the set S to the set of all sentential expressions. It turns out that there exists sentential expression of system which neither is its theorem nor belongs to rejected expression. Thus, Bukashevich brought up the following problem. How to expand on Aristotle's logic in such a way that each of its expressions is either its theorem or a rejected expression. A solution for this problem was found by his disciples to them. Solving the problem put a forward by Subetsky by uh, Lukashevich, Subetsky apart from the rejection rules accepted uh, by Lukashevich introduced into the syllogistic system a completely new uh, rule specific uh, for the system. The rule due to its uh, historical and not only significance is called the Subetsky rule. In context, who is the Subetsky rule if the expression gamma which is included in the rule does not follow from both negative sentences alpha and beta then it not, does not follow from the conjunction. After attaching uh, Subetsky's rule to Lukashevich's rejection rule, Subetsky proved that it is enough to accept only one of Lukashevich's assertive si si uh, action, and each sentential expression of logistic is either a theorem or a rejected expression. Thus, more formally, Subetsky proved the following two uh, conditions.
Mukhashik is acknowledged the result obtained by Kvetsky as revelatory. And as he himself wrote in his article and then in the monograph, the author regards this as the most significant discovery made in the field of the logistics since Aristotle. Tupetsky in his post-war research used a certain definition of rejection for equivalent to definition uh, accepted by Mukasheki. This definition and also its extension was applied by Tupetsky to bi-level formalization of other logical systems. Because the satisfying of the condition one and two for any logical system, the decidability of the system. You can take it use the term saturated system with reference to such a system. The bilateral formalization of Aristotle's logistic introduced by Ukashevich and developed by Subetsky, the pioneers of this approach, gave rise to the studies which were commonly conducted later in the application of the two axiomatic methods of proving to buy aspectual formalization of logical systems. The bilateral formalization also concerns system with, with the use of antimatter. The antimatter system deriving from Kenton and Piaskowski differ in significant way. They are, however, similar to each other in that they are not axiomatic systems based solely on inference rules and proof constituting rules. There have been conducted many studies on uh, them and the natural method of proving theorems applied in them was generalized and called the generalized method of natural deduction, the NT method. It differs from the ordinary one, since in formalization of the system, it assumes not only ordinary assertive proving rule, but also rejection one. And the only rule of constraining uh, a proof is the rule of forming an uh, indirect proof. The NG method, like the ordinary ND method, has a great number of applications. I have already mentioned the historical significance of the axiomatic and the and, and method initiated by Lukashevich and Yashkovsky. They exerted an enormous influence on studies and results of other something representative of the Russian school, that disciples, disciples of the latter, and the many others. These methods are used not only in logic, but also in different scientific disciplines. They have contributed to practical implement, uh, <coughs> implementation of this domain, therefore not only to construct logical systems. I shall discuss theoretical and practical participation with this, uh, this method necessarily within the arbitrary outline of this. The axiomatic method made the most commonly applied method in the world of school. Here, different fully formalized logical system, classical and non-classical, were created for people. At the same time, it was endeavored in the uh, walls of school successfully obtaining evaluated that that is possible to perfect automatization of a given calculus through formulating possible the smallest number of axioms with the use of possible the smallest number of principles. As regards the Wasso school, the significance of, of such a precise axiomatic framing of a logical system was firmly stressed, which was uh, not always considered and uh, of importance by logicians from the outside the school. Apart from the above, a practical or intuitive notation was applied 
u Kašetića da mu radite on his current physics free notation now today as a Polish notation. It is useful in particular in automatic proving of theorems. Leśniewski, while building his free logical system, applied another original intuitive notation. All of three Leśniewski systems were axiomatically formalized in this with great redundancy from the point of view of requirements of correct and precise formalization. Although they did not meet uh, the creation, uh, creator's expectation, today they make the object of exploration by many logicians and philosophers throughout the world. The methodological approach to the way as well as the axiomatic method of characterization of deductive system as uh, assertion system and rejection system introduced by Lukasiewicz and developed by Supersky has proved relevant in modern approaches to logic. By level axiomatization, the formalization of deductive system of sentence and name evoked a broad response in the literature after the work. I present the most important results related to uh, this formalization and the uh, decidability of some important logical systems. <laughs> after the war, Ukasiewicz, staying abroad in Dublin, mentioned the classical propositional calculus with the inference rules his inference rules and his rejection rules is decided. He used the high level <coughs> formalization in his research on intuitionistic logic, but he did not prove a decidability of this logic. On the other hand, he proved a decidability of more valid model logic uh, uh, built by himself. At the same time, in Poland, further studies inspired by Suwerki on outsideability of the dark system and the very notion of the justice uh, proposition itself were carried out. Suwerki's research on Aristotle's theories was continued mainly by Boguslav Ivanush. Ivanush, in particular, gave a proof of outdecidability of all traditional calculus of men. That is the system of Aristotle's artistic and reached by nominal negation. Achievements uh, in studies of uh, outdecidability of propositional logic, besides uh, the results obtained by Lukasiewicz, are uh, very proud. I will present some important results on the on the screen. The axiomatic method uh, and its uh, variants, the uh, ordinary and uh, the rejection method from the application in methodological studies related to the theory of the adaptive system. The axiomatic theory is built by that, the general theory of the adaptive system, and the theory of the adaptive system based on classical logic gave not only an impulse to provide some axiomatic system of consequent theories founded on non-classical logic, but also contributed to expand uh, both, uh, both Tarski's theory that characterized rejection consequences. Tupetsky generalized the notion of rejection and on the basis of Tarski's generalized consequence theory defined the concept of rejection consequence as well as, as gave it general property. Out of the inspiration that the supervision of Tupetsky the axiomatic theory of rejected proposition was formed. Some application of this theory uh, in methodology of empirical sciences can be found in paper uh, Szupetsky-Brill-Skardowska. Uh, 
they were connected with the method of rejection of hypothesis that is commonly used in this field. Okay. The rejection consequence uh, is the so-called limit consequence. And when we generalize to primitistic rejection consequence, referred to as the newer consequence with respect to the of the net consequence. Intuitively, both of these rejection consequences, in contrast to the ordinary consequence operation leading from two sentences of the system to the two sentences of the system, fit from false or unacceptable expression of the system to false or unacceptable expression of the system. Rejection consequences were applied to construct the so-called dual calculus. It is worth noting to, uh, with reference to Potter's contraction of comparing scientific theory, Jan Bolesky found an interesting application of the consequences to examination of true content and false content of a given theory. Professor, I'm, I'm very sorry, but we are running off time. Do you think you could finish in something like two or three minutes? Yes, I need a uh, five minutes. Okay. In the end, I would like to observe that Tarski in his famous uh, work on the notion of truth made use uh, the axiomatic method character, uh, characterizing the language of metascience, in which he defined his important notion. Given axioms for metascience, he proceeded from the notion of concatenation. These axioms for concatenation are cited today in all verbal languages, and his theory is now in the world as the string theory, or the theory of concatenation. It also has an influence on constructing the theory of categorical languages. The antimetal is simpler regarding its application than the axiomatic one. Then this system, deriving from Yashkovsky, was perfected by Supetsky and Gorkovsky, and they are designed with. The uh, more perfect, uh, perfect simplified version of Yashkovsky's system is more practical, since proofs are very intuitive. One can find numerous applications of this version of them in this system in logic and set theory, in books written in Poland, Polish, and in English. It is used in both teaching logic and proving in different sciences when the need arises to apply uh, applied system. The anti uh, uh, system of Supertsky and Borkowski has, has still another great value. It was applied to automatic proving of theorems. It can be achieved by means of uh, computer programming wizard, which is uh, now well known in the world. Contradictory remarks. The Poposo school was the most significant Polish philosophical formation in the 20th century. Logic was particularly uh, att uh, attractive in the peculiar wing of the Poposo school, that is, uh, the Poposo school of logic. The founders of this school, Jan Łukasiewicz and Stanisław Leśniewski, as well as uh, Alfred Tarski, invested it with a style which brought out a specific manner of practicing logic. It was based on the theoretical assumption of the autonomous status of mathematical logic as a discipline which was not part of either philosophy or mathematics. Also, as it well now, the establishment of those of school was rooted in both philosophy and mathematics. That resulted in implementation of special program and practice in logic, applying special techniques and methods of proving theorems or refuting them, including completely new methods. They also contributed to obtaining significant and outstanding results 
also on the like global scale. Thank you for your attention. There are two situations in the problem of axiomatization, the logical axiomatization, or formalized axiomatization of theory. One situation when is when we have a, so to speak, normal theory and why we want to, to reformulate it in axiomatic system. And the second is uh, when uh, we try to, to uh, well, to make an, a set of axioms to suppose uh, uh, that these and, th and these uh, sentences are axioms, we have such and such rules and, and what? Well, my question is, is this in the second situation when we construct uh, the uh, well, theory Axiomat, which is axiomites, axiomatized, mm. it is sufficient to to give these axioms and rules, or we should add some theorems, and if so, how many? One, two, infinitely many? Could you, in a few words, to explain my naive question? When we uh, axiomatize uh, some uh, sentence, some some uh, uh, some disciplines, didactic disciplines, we need some axioms, uh, perhaps uh, non-infinite, uh, and some primitive rules. By means of uh, primitive rules and these axioms, we can uh, we should uh, uh, prove all theorems of this discipline, this didactic right. discipline. Uh, um, if we, if we can do this, then uh, the axiomatization of the theory is not perfect. Well, but in the situation when we simply construct such a system, well, this system is equal to axioms and rules, or, well, it should contain also some theorems, or, if so, how many? Because I think that the problem of completeness in such a situation is not at stage, am I right? I don't understand well your question. Uh, because uh, uh, the completeness of the uh, theorems is uh, uh, consists in uh, that we should uh, uh, prove all theorems of uh, this science. Yes. Then, uh, then, if we uh, would like to reject some uh, some theorems, then we uh, should use. The another uh, proving method by reputation, by rejection. Uh, but, uh, and the problem is if, um, besides the uh, theorems of the theorem, uh, theory, theory uh, or then uh, besides uh, the um, reputation expression, we can give all expression of the science. If not, then uh, the theory is not uh, precise. Well, so I think I I try to explain my problem in private discussion. So thank you for your reaction. Okay, that's a great decision because we are running out of time. Once again, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, our last speaker today is uh, Zuzana Ribajikova. 
from University of Ostrava, and uh, the title of her lecture is Mathematical Logic in the History of Logic, Łukasiewicz uh, Requirements and uh, its Reception. Professor uh, Wybranicka-Joska, if we could ask you for stop your presentation. Yes, yes, yes.
the requirement to push which formulated this requirement several times in his writings and uh, in one paper when he uh, generally talk about the needs of, uh, of the logic in Poland, he also uh, mentioned that uh, Polish Poland needs a history of logic who will be accomplished with the logic, with the good normal languages, which is the original text were written, like Greek or Latin, uh, would know the history, and of course will know the mathematical logic. This uh, first two are obvious. I mean, every historian should know the language in which his, source, his or her sources were written. Uh, he or uh, her also have to know the history, but this is something which was uh, this Lukashevich's uh, contribution to it. Uh, and uh, it's quite strange that um, uh, Lukashevich, and he was not the first one who actually used the mathematical logic into history of logic. Uh, originally, when he started to write about the history of logic, didn't point it out that the mathematical, that the mathematical logic is uh, is important to use be use it as a tool. That history of logic had to know the mathematical logic as a tool. Uh, as I said, Lukashevich was not the first one. It was mathematical logic was previously used by several other historians of logic. I think the first one may be the Charles and the Spurs, but Lukashevich was the first one who put it as a requirement. And uh, I argue, and it's not just from my head, it's, uh, I think it's uh, common known that the reason why he formulated this requirement and used it uh, afterwards in his, uh, in his writing was the fact that he, he encountered Karl Brandt's approach to stoic logic. That uh, uh, Karl Brandt write a huge uh, monumental work on uh, logic in the West, this, uh, in the West and uh, when he write about, so, I mean, this is like it's a very monumental book. There are so lot of sources. It's a it's a huge work. But uh, when he write about stoic logic, he consider it as a corrupted version of the uh, of the Aristotelian logic. It means it's a couple of names, and he based his argument on this type of uh, syllogism, which he presented uh, as a stoic syllogism. Uh, and uh, to be honest, uh, it's not, he was not the first who presented this type of syllogism as, as a stoic syllogism. Uh, Benson Mates and uh, Joseph Bukhansky mentions that this uh, reconstruction of stoic syllogism already appeared in ancient times uh, because they confuse, there, there's a confusion between is and is true. Because if you like, if there is true, it would be similar to this one. But if you present uh, stoic syllogism like that, it looks like it looked like uh, a, a, it looked like a, to be part, part of calculus of names. That the, the, the variables here are standing for names, but as uh, Lukashevich pointed out, it was not the case. The variables are actually standing for uh, propositional calculus, which Brandt uh, didn't know, so he didn't consider that this could be the case, that uh, the situations are perfectly fine. But it's not a calculus of names, but calculus of propositions. Um, stoic logic is not, not important just for the, for the rehabilitation of stoics, but in the paper, Mukashevich also discussed a scholastic logic, because he claimed that uh, uh, in scholastic logic, the calculus of propositions was also used. And in the, in the ending part of the paper, he also discussed Frege and his contribution to the calculus of propositions. Um, But uh, maybe the more important contribution, which is all, also all mentioned today, was his reconstruction of Aristotle's logistics. Uh, in this reconstruction, it uh, seemingly uh, do, uh, do a step forward because when he talked about uh, stoic logic, uh, he uh, still talked about calculus of propositions, the classical calculus of propositions, about, uh, who was uh, known at the time. But uh, when he talked about Aristotle's logistic, he reconstructed uh, the calculus of names, which he uh, believed is true uh, to Aristotle's logistics. Um, and uh, he, in the book, uh, mentioned that uh, Aristotle's logistic is in very dubious positions in his time because, on one hand, there is traditional logic who thought they are true for, to Aristotle, but the, they are not. Uh, they are, the system is not. Uh, uh, the Aristotle one, which is uh, why I have presented here these two types of syllogisms. And on the other hand, there is this modern predicate logic, and uh, the authors who write the modern predicate logic, they pointed out 
that Aristotle's logic is problematic, just of syllogism which doesn't hold in friendly middle of calculus. So, Aristotle, uh, so I'm sorry, Lukash would you want to uh, introduce a system which will be proved by Aristotle, but uh, also which will the, 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 which will not contain the problems which uh, appear in front page calculus. Uh, so he introduced in his book a system of uh, Aristotle syllogistics. But uh, I presented this as a step, step forward. It's like a new system that was uh, introduced uh, to reconstruct Aristotle's thoughts. But uh, I'm not sure if Lukács well, saw this uh, as a way in this way because he used Aristotle syllogistics as his calculus of names. He used predicate, uh, predicate of predicate. Sorry. Uh, propositional calculus uh, as a, a propositional calculus, and instead of predicate calculus, in his textbook he used Aristotle's syllogistics. Uh, so for him, it was just a calculus of name which could be used. Uh, the past of uh, so uh, the difference I presented here are uh, is, uh, for questions there are several important differences, but. The first one we Yuji mentioned and which she thought are quite important is the fact that uh, Aristotle already used something like variables. And another important thing which I would like to point out is that according to Gashevich, Aristotle's syllogisms were not uh, rules of inferences or like syllogisms which are which we understand syllogisms, it means they are not valid or invalid, but he considered them to be conditionals, to be true or false. Um, so this was his reason why he also uh, Provided syllogism as an axiom of his of his uh, of his uh, syllogistics uh, with uh, all of the rules of identity and some other rules which are all represented by Professor Vivenskarovska. And so when he has this calculus of names, as Professor Vivenskarovska uh, presented uh, in a little bit before, uh, he can use he can prove several several uh, several uh, syllogisms that appear in Aristotle, but also some other new findings that couldn't be found in Aristotle. So, uh, I will now go, go to the reception. Uh, I firstly uh, would like to discuss the reception in Poland. I mean, uh, this is quite well known. Uh, the reason why I want to discuss it is the fact that uh, uh, people like uh, Bokinski, Sarabuka were also the one who uh, who made this Lukashevich uh, approach more widely known in uh, abroad? Uh, and uh, there were also researchers from the uh, above Krakow Circle, from the Warsaw School, who used this Lukashevich uh, method, but uh, I will not discuss them here at the moment because I don't have time. But if you have some questions to them, I would be glad to answer them in the discussion. Uh, so I will, I will focus on the Krakow Circle. And uh, what I would like to point out is that. Uh, if they want to adopt a Bashir's methodology and they want to discuss um, history of logic, but their focus was not on history of logic, there was uh, theology in general, they were a group of neo-scholastic uh, philosophers who liked to use uh, mathematical logic as a tool for theology and history of uh, philosophy. And he had to uh, fight for this methodology and uh, fight for neutrality of mathematical logic. Well, it was not just them, also Lukashevich has to discuss neutrality of uh, mathematical logic in his, several of his papers, like the, the most famous are maybe are in defense of logistics and uh, logistics and philosophy. Uh, but uh, uh, this method was also discussed by the members of the Krakow Circle and they pointed out that using the traditional logic that was used by the theology in Poland is a bit outdated because when uh, Thomas Aquinas wrote his uh, Summa Theologiae, he did also didn't count on some old uh, method uh, from ancient times, but he used what was added at the time a cutting edge of science. It was Aristotle was newly discovered, and there was this attempt to uh, to make Aristotle more uh, acceptable for theologians, and that was uh, that was uh, Thomas Aquinas' aim. So he didn't, he didn't do something which was outdated. He, he, he knew something which was uh, new, modern, and the modern uh, philosophical logic, uh, modern, uh, modern mathematical logic. Uh, similarly, in the uh, famous paper of Salmuka, there is this uh, uh, there is this uh, unification of mathematical logic, and there is written that uh, uh, it's better to use uh, it's better to use train or uh, airplane than a steady coach, which. 
be the uh, traditional logic. Because using mathematical logic, we can prove more, we can show uh, more nicely that how brilliant were the authors from the history. And uh, finally, I also mentioned something which you know, is some kind of different uh, paper, uh, and this is something which I found quite important because uh, he also mentioned then the people who are dealing with traditional logic thought that they are dealing with this uh, right logic that came from Aristotle or Thomas Aquinas, that is a system that were used by them, but he pointed out that it is not the case. That the traditional logic, the tool that uh, those scholastics use, or was actually a version that was that also contains uh, ideas from uh, Cordial, ideas from even Kant. So this is something which is modern, which is not actually truthful to uh, the scholastic uh, authors. When I finally point out to my uh, main interest today, and it is the reception approach, uh, I want to follow Lukas Sherry's. Uh, Discussion because when he, when he uh, talked about the reception of his work abroad, he uh, di differentiated between people who are focused on historic logic and people who are focused or influenced by his work on Aristotle statistics. Uh, you may see that uh, there are people who just work on historic logic, but there is also uh, Francisca, uh, Francisca Piotros Werner who, uh, who followed uh, Lukashenko's work on historic logic, but it was work on the scholastics, and uh, he wrote in his book, and he, he followed in his book on scholastics, not just Lukashevich, but also Salamuka and Bohemsky. And uh, in the case of Aristotle Statistic, uh, Lukashevich don't mention who, or who followed him, he just mentioned that there are like over 30 reactions, uh, but I will discuss uh, all John Corcoran, who's already mentioned, and Timothy Smile, because uh, they approached Aristotle Statistic as far as I know, is quite influential and although it's criticism of Lukas uh, So, but I first I want to mention uh, Heinrich Schott because he was, um, he may be partially influenced by Lukas but he was also history of logic and his uh, book, uh, The History of Logic, uh, writes uh, independent, slightly, somehow independently. He, he, he mentioned in the book uh, some findings of Lukas but uh, independently of Lukas he uh, he met uh, uh, modern formal logic, he started to appreciate it and uh, uh, write in the format of the book that he want to that he want to apply it in the history of logic and that it, 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 it gives, gives him a reason to write a new book about the history of logic even though there is this great book of Karl Brandner and many other historians of logic. Uh, and uh, he also was in touch with uh, logicians from the Lumors school he don't just focus on historic logic, even though his inf uh, the influence in the book which the logic uh, concerns uh, Lukashevich's work on historic logic, but uh, he was the one who uh, pointed out, out to Darsky that his work on logical consequences uh, resembles uh, also uh, some work of Bodin. Uh, but when I uh, focus on this pure influence of historic logic, it was uh, mentioned and was mentioned several times when some mates wrote, uh, wrote a book about historic logic, and he clearly in the book, uh, on several places, uh, uh, tells his gratitude to Lukashevich and uh, his uh, published work. And uh, similar to uh, the Berner, who, as I said, wrote about his uh, scholastics and uh, Mentioned that the scholars from the Warsaw School, he mentioned some of them hasty, but they are, uh, they are continuing the Shavit work and the Shavit is also mentioned here. Uh, so, as I said, uh, there were several examples who uh, mentioned uh, Lukas Shavit's aim in the social logic, especially at the beginning, because uh, Mainz and Werner, they are quite uh, all the books. Uh, they is even as I as I have known they know even know Bashevich personally. Um, as to our social logistics, uh, uh approach is also appreciated. There is uh, uh, also mentioned that Lukashevich's work is extremely important, but in majority of texts that on our social logistics that I encounter and are not from Poland but abroad from abroad. Uh, Lukashevich's approach is more or less criticized. I mean, 
in this uh, two quotes, I uh, draw quotes that evocation uh, is mostly appreciated. But if you read, uh, the, uh, if you have the occasion to read the whole papers of Smiley, uh, of Smiley or Karkaran, you can see that they are, he is more, mostly criticized. Uh, and uh, this is the case of uh, the majority of paper about the Kashmir Solstice that I encounter. Uh, Karkaran, for instance, he uh, not even have a problem with uh, this uh, with Rukashevich's conception of sociologism, uh, which he found uh, uh, he found uh, unbearable, and uh, all, but also with the fact that Rukashevich thought that uh, Aristotle's sociologistic was built on some propositional calculus, probably some somehow close to stoic logic, uh, and Karkaran disagreed with this uh, with this view, <coughs> and similar to Smiley. Uh, so. Uh, and uh, I promised that I, at the beginning I promised that I would tell you something about the reception today, which I didn't do so far. And the fact is, that as far as I discovered, I, uh, I'm sure that I didn't saw uh, many sources, but for instance, it's quite nicely visible in Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, that usually, I mean, uh, Aristotle is logistic, or Aristotle in general is discussed, Lukashevich is mentioned. Uh, this is the case all in, in Aristotle logic, uh, uh, in uh, Central Encyclopedia. It's also, for instance, mentioned uh, in uh, uh, Square of Position, which is so important logical stuff of Lukashevich. And uh, there are several, several uh, newly published papers when Lukashevich is discussed. He is usually discussed critically. There is usually said Lukashevich started this approach, but he was not right. He has some problems, and it's developed. But uh, there is this notion that Lukashevich actually formalized this, uh, uh, Aristotle's logistic, and it's a very important figure in the history of dealing with Aristotle. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a case so in the Stoic logic, and, especially, and also not in the medieval studies, as far as I know. There are some authors who um, acknowledge Lukashevich's uh, importance, for instance, uh, Susan Kubitsen, or, uh, or historian of logic from Bratislava, Professor Kahe, Professor Markov, but in general, it's, uh, this, uh, Lukashevich's contribution is forgotten and similar to medieval studies. Uh, so my conclusion will be that Lukashevich has some, some approach, but unfortunately, it's forgotten it's to some, some, some extent, especially among some scholars. So I'm glad that, that there is a conference where it is discussed the history of logic and history, historian of logic that may, that may be the importance of Irish numbers of Lukashevich will be discussed and uh, revealed again. So thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions. <laughs> organization of time because uh, we've got uh, still uh, like um, six uh, minutes of for discussion. Um, yes, uh, Colin would like to start. Thank you so much, Susanna. I want to contradict you with one thing. Okay. Namely, uh, what you said, Lukasiewicz's work is forgotten these days. We who work in the history of ancient logic, mm -hmm. you have to know this book, otherwise you don't mm -hmm. know what you're talking about. So. Well, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. I, I don't think this, 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 this I don't, I, my, my uh, conclusion was that this, uh, this book, this Aristotle of Statistics is a good book, but his work on Stoics are. And I for me, I don't think that's uh, true. What, well, is, what is contested is his insistence on the ultimate difference between what he calls made logic mm -hmm. and uh, propositional logic. Mm -hmm. That's contested for various reasons. Yes, yes. What is also contested, of course, is the claim that um, valid syllogistic uh, modes are theses. Now, that's contested for a, a variety of reasons. Some people want to contextualize Aristotle's syllogistic in a theory of argument. Mm -hmm. and, and pretty clearly, syllogisms are premise conclusion arguments. Pache, mm -hmm. Lukasiewicz. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you want to tell some developmental story about Aristotle's logic, as for example, T.D. Solomonson did in his 1929 book, uh, the very influential book in my field, then 
you can't have Vukasyevich's view because what Vukasyevich tries to do is cut this part of the organon out, put it on a pedestal, and then it's decontextualized in a way that's just not very convincing. That's how Vukasyevich got criticized, um, I think, by people who were qualified, at least, with regard to Aristotle. By people like Smiley and Corcoran, they're simply influenced by a different paradigm in mathematical logic, and they're not criticizing, as it were, um, the formal aspect. They're criticizing its adequacy at capturing the intention of the system. But still, everybody still reads this book, even though we all accept that it's no longer safe. Thank you. Uh, I think I, I, I want to say, say that he's, he's more appreciated this Aristotelian branch than it's in the Stoic branch. And I hope that I don't, but I completely agree with you. For instance, I'm, I was, and I'm still quite interested in the problem of existential import. And there is people like Stephen Reed or Terence Parsons who criticize Bukashvich from, uh, from his approach to existential import. Uh, but it seems to me that it is the, his book is still vivid and still 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 criticized. <laughs> and, and, and just one little footnote. I don't know if you know, but Suzanne Boxy published an article last year with the title Frege Plagiarized the Stoics. Yes, and in this article she claims that Pag Tantl is such a reliable source on the Stoics that Hegel could have plagiarized the Stoics if no all he read is Pag Tantl. Yes. Uh, well, there is there is another discussion of, about this this article by, written by Professor Gahe, which I mentioned from Rocky Pakislava, and he has a very interesting talk about uh, the article in when we we as like mentioned Czechs and Slovaks so logicians together, and uh, uh, what was what struck me when I read the article, and what strikes me more when I heard the the, the presentation of Professor Gahe, and we agree on that, is that she quotes uh, Lukashevich, but uh, in Lukashevich it's clear. That uh, the Prantl despised Stoic, so it's like it's very strange to thought that uh, uh, Frege could be could be uh, could be uh, could be influenced by by Prantl because I didn't mention it in my talk, but uh, there is it's I when I wrote this Prantl, I was uh, stuck by the the verbal language he used. It's uh, unusual in academia how badly he addressed uh, Stoics. Stoic, the yes, yes, I mean, this. It is a, this, uh, quite amazing psychological uh, problem that the man from who hated logic was Hegelian, wrote because of this hatred the three big volumes of this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, thank you for thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much for a very instructive talk. Uh, and I'm sorry that my question is not related to the main point of it, uh, but I'm very curious about uh, the way the Krakow Circle is presented in various texts. Uh, you mentioned Peter Theos Bonhoeffer passage about them, uh, calling them uh, the Warsaw School. Yeah, so probably something strange, but uh, the topic of schools, how they are perceived, is very interesting for me, and I, I'm curious about. Uh, uh, whether uh, you, you found different or, or, or sim similar uh, ways of calling them, like uh, not uh, the Krakow Circle, but for instance, work, the Warsaw School, because it's nice that they uh, have been presented as a as a strict group. Well, uh, I, but what what, no, well, you know, there's a, there's a, there is a reason why to call them more so. But but maybe it was not more so, uh, Maybe Winner doesn't just there's just, there's just them because there were other logicians yeah. in the whole Warsaw school who, who deal with history of logic. Uh, uh, scholars from the Warsaw school. Yeah, well, I see. Uh, but you know, there is a reason why to call them because they, it's called Krakow Circle. But yeah. the fact that it, they won't seat in Krakow. Krakow was yeah. Slavoj, but just but he was also a priest in Warsaw. Also, uh, Bokensky was there. Uh, well, he was there. He's, he's, uh, for some time, he was uh, building a monastery. Did he make a monastery in Spurge? So, he was near Warsaw, or now it's what you call Warsaw. So, uh, so uh, well, I didn't, I didn't see. Because before the war, uh, Salam got chair in Krakow, mm -hmm. but then he, he was arrested during the Zonderaktion. Yeah? Mm -hmm. 
question. So, uh, but but there are more, more connections with Warsaw than with Prague. Uh, it, 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 it seems to me in a dead way. And maybe when the Warsaw Warsaw just like the, the members of Warsaw School. But I know that there is a discussion whether Krakow Circle is actually uh, yeah. part of Warsaw yeah. School. I think so, but I know that there are people who are, who, who, who disagree with me at this point. Okay, so maybe last question. Then a very see. short question. Uh, why did you not take into consideration Patrick's book about uh, Aristotle's images? Uh, well, the uh, thing is that uh, there are uh, several, several people uh, at the time who criticize uh, or who or followed and also criticize Lukashevich or one of them. Uh, for instance, my favorite is Fryer because mm -hmm. I f focus on, on the work several times, but I just want to focus on this uh, Korka and Smaila because for me, the criticism of this, uh, of the, on the conditional uh, notion and uh, on the base, the, on, the, on the connection between this uh, proposition calculus and uh, Aristotle's logistic is something which is quite important. But there are several logicians who could be taken into account for discussing Aristotle's receptions of, uh, receptions of uh, Lukashev's Aristotle's logistic. But it was just a matter of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. for all talks today and one announcement tomorrow we are meeting at 10:40 uh, uh, not at uh, 10 because of uh, uh, one cancellation of uh, professor Irina Komenko from uh, from uh, um, from Kiev uh, she is unable to deliver her lecture so we will start with professor Murawski's lecture at 10:40 and tomorrow we will meet at Krakowskie Przedmieście 3 at uh, Faculty of Philosophy University of Warsaw thank you for today and see you tomorrow